Uh, first of all, Sean, thanks a lot for coming on here, man. I appreciate it. Uh, it's we were just talking before we, we hit record. Uh, it's been forever since we've seen each other, but you and I, we started relatively about the same time. I mean, we we were were you you were in a tech school class ahead of me, or were you behind I, me? I was behind you. Okay. You were you were somebody who I wanted to be. Oh my God! That, that 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 early on. Don't start uh, that. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I was with me me and Schleich, uh Mikey Brown, uh, I think we were all in like the class right behind you. Oh, you were okay. Baby flight. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't remember. I know. Uh, I know we were all there, kind of about the same time. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, tell me. Um, let's start from the beginning. Like where, uh, what what prompted you to get in the military? Like what was your, what was the catalyst? I know. I know. I read in your bio. You you and I were kind of in the same boat where uh, Desert Storm was getting ready to kick off, and uh, um, frankly. You said that uh, you were wanting to get in because of it. I, I had no idea. I mean, I, I'd seen it on TV, but I just didn't court. I was so young. I was stupid. I didn't correlate the two. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm getting ready to get in the military. And this thing's still going on. I didn't. And then by the time we got in, it was over. But yeah. So tell me about that. Tell me about, um, you know, what your 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 background before you got in the military, what kind of prompted you to get in and and that kind of thing. All right. Um, well, uh, I was I was born in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and, and actually grew up there, uh, you know, pretty much most of my life other than moving. We, we did move around a lot like I would, you know, my my dad's side of the family was from New Jersey. So we did live there for a little bit. And then my mom and dad got divorced. Um, so then I kind of hopped around to like Ohio, um, Pennsylvania to where my aunt and uncle's lived and we okay. would stay with them for a little bit and then I, eventually we'd always end up back in Colorado Springs because that's where my grandparents lived oh, okay uh, and that's where my mom felt most comfortable so I think at the age of probably seven or eight is when we like that that was like maybe 10 that that was like s steady you know okay. where where I, I stayed pretty much in Colorado Springs from from then on moved around a lot in Colorado Springs, you know, different, different schools, but my grandparents and everything were always, uh, that steady place for me. You know, their house was yeah. always my home essentially is how I thought of it. Cool. Um, so I bump, I bounced around through a lot of different high, like three or four different high schools and finally, uh, finished, uh, got into one where I had a very good wrestling coach, um, some good football coaches that really took the time to focus on me and, and let me be who I needed to be. Nice. And so, um, in that I, I started, you know, the discipline and stuff from my, from my grandparents, you know, plus these coaches, uh, really had me, I, I've never really thought about the military. I was thinking about college sports. That's, sure. that was my route. And, uh, my mom was dating a guy who, was an officer at the Air Force Academy. He was a he was a teacher. Oh, okay. He is a prior. He was a prior PJ. Oh, okay. And so this dude was just he he was a cool dude. Yeah. A really cool dude. And uh, and so he was always kind of talking to me about going to the prep school at the academy and playing football for the prep school and then getting into the academy because my grades were not at that level to go straight to the right. academy. But he's <laughs> like, God, oh, you're definitely a you know, a prep school kind of guy, you know? Okay. Um, and so that's the route I wanted to go, but then an opportunity came up for me to go down to Arizona state. And so I just took that route. It was where my buddies were, you know, it was like, yeah, yeah. and it was, you know, you say ASU, that's way more cool than air force Academy. Right. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> so bad thing is, is it's also ASU, you know? Right. So, um, <laughs> And I wasn't, I was not ready for that. I was not brought up in, you know, the way to like, I had zero study ethics. I had, you know what I mean? Yeah, School yeah. was not important to me um, at that time. Right. And so I got down there and it just wasn't working out in any realm, sports, school. Um, but I was having, a, I had a, I had a great time. And during that time while I was down there was when the whole Iraq thing started spinning up. Okay. Was, um the year 1990 because i graduated high school uh that's that spring the next day i was in a car on my way down to arizona state wow 
So for trying to get into the, going to training camp up in Flagstaff, but sure, sure. That's, that was just that quick, you know, man. Yeah. And, uh, and so it just, you know, but by the end of the year, not, not, not much was working out at the school for me. So I wanted to join. So I went in, I had come back to Colorado Springs. Uh, and while I was back in Colorado Springs, I saw the recruiter and I was like, Hey, I want to go PJ. And he's like, man, he's like, I don't, he's like, you can't, you can't, I can't sign you up for PJ. He goes, but you can go open general. And then you can go through the tryout to take the pass test while you're in basic. Right, right. I was like, all right, well, how do I get there? He's like, well, let's pick a job. And I was like, well, I don't want to, I'm not a desk person. So, yeah. so he's like looking through and he's like, mm, there's this one job. It's a fact job. And I was like, a fact. I was like, what's a fact? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> and then he, he literally. Standard recruiter thing. Man. Yes. He's <laughs> like, this is all I tell you. He's like, you wear a beret and you'll blouse your boots. He's like, and then you'll stand in a tower somewhere and control airplanes. Like, and I was like, control them. He's like, yeah. He's like, I don't know. He's like, you talk to airplanes. He <laughs> right. didn't even know that was, there was close air support, but uh, he did know that you blouse your boots and you wear a beret. That's okay. that is the only thing he knew. <laughs> and he's like, but you don't have to do that job. You're going to try out for a PJ. So he's All like, right. just put that, you know, he's like, I'll sign you up for that. I'm like, cool. <laughs> I had no idea what it was. No. Yeah. Uh, so I get to basic, everything's going good. Well, me and a, a guy I had met at the MEPS, his name was Jay Pankoff. He went, him and I went to basic together. Okay. He was also, he got the same line I did from this recruiter. Right. And so <laughs> he was doing the same thing I was, and we both were going to go do the pass test, uh, for the PJ trial. And then we got in trouble, our, oh, no. like our whole, like our whole flight or whatever got in trouble. And so we missed the trials for the past. Oh test. no. We had like one chance. Right. Yeah, yeah. So him and I are like looking at each other, and next thing you know, we're graduating. We're on a plane down to Herbert Field, Florida. <laughs> no idea what we're doing. Yeah. And uh, I mean, we even show up and we go into the day room. You remember the day room at the time, yeah. the where the T, the TIs hung out, yeah, or yeah. whatever they were called. The uh, and there's that old dude. I don't know if you remember that really old guy that was there. Yeah. What was his name? I do remember who uh, you're talking about. Jim, Jim, or something. Jim, something. But he was yeah. like. Vietnam era type. Right. Man. I think he was just buying his time. <laughs> and we went in there and he talked to us for like three minutes and, you know, behind him, he had that big picture of the, like the skull with the snake and right. Right. Um, said death on call. And we're just like, what the hell are we doing here? And he didn't tell us anything. Right. Yeah. yeah. So he shows us to our dorm and we walk in and there's a buck sergeant sitting in there and we're like, well, maybe this dude knows. <laughs> so we're like, Hey man, what are we doing? He's like, I don't know. He's like, I just want to cross train. I had to get out of my finance job or whatever it was. <laughs> and we're like, so no idea. Like nobody knows. Still anything. no idea what you're doing there. And then, so everybody starts rolling in and somebody comes into the day room and they're like, all right, zero 0700 tomorrow morning. We're going to meet, you know, out in front of the dorms. He's like, and they're like, you know, shorts and a t-shirt. Yeah. I'm like, okay, and dude, then that next day it was on like, yeah, you know, and yep. it was like, wow, what the hell are we doing? But right. I mean, they just took us and ran us and dudes were puking and it was, it was crazy. I yeah. mean, I think we lost that buck sergeant. He was gone that, oh, yeah. that was day one. He was, he was gone, man. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of our class was all like a one C's and airmen, dude. We yeah, didn't yeah. have any rank in there. And then we would see, you know, and then we saw you guys, you know, and you guys were like all like squared away and we were just like this gaggle and, <laughs> uh, and that's how it started, man. And, and I, you know, and, uh, dude, they, you know, I think I remember the first run they told us, they're like, grab your junk. And we're like, what? Yeah. We're like, grab your junk. And yeah. Like, what is this dude doing? Right. And so they grab it and then they're like, forward march and they're like kill 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 and then yeah. we started running and yeah. i was like what the hell what is doing? happening yeah <laughs> and it was on man and then yeah you know and then our instructors and you know you just revered them you know the oh SPs yeah speeds and uh do you i don't know if you remember those guys but i just remember our instructors i thought man oh yeah these dudes are freaking badass i want to be just like them yeah and, for sure uh, and had no had no clue and then 
Um, you know, then we had an opportunity to do the airborne thing, right. you know, you volunteer for airborne. And I think you had done that too, because yep. again, there was like three of you guys. I, I want to say it was, yeah, it was me. You, I want to say Scardino. Sundance. Yeah. So Scardino. Yeah. And then, uh, and was Desa Vedra one of those? Desa I, Vedra. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I was like, dude, I want to be like those dudes. Cause you guys were like, you guys were studs, man. I, I, I remember, man. You I was just trying to keep studs. up with those guys. <laughs> you guys were studs. And I was like, I want to be like those dudes. So it was myself, I think, uh, Mikey Brown, um, Warren. Can't remember, uh, Warren. And then we had some other dude that was in there, but us, it ended up only being three of us. Yeah. And we, we did the airborne thing. And so we did, you know, went to finish tech school, went to survival school, then to airborne school. And then yeah. I had orders, you know, of course you get orders to brag, you know, back, I guess, you know, everybody was getting, if you were airborne volunteer, then you went to brag. Right. Right. Know? Um, or we did anyway. I don't know where, I know you guys well, did and you guys went to like Arizona or something. Yeah. Sundance and I went to Arizona. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure where Des went, but yeah, we got lucky. Uh, I think Ray Carvalho pulled some strings and, you know, they needed some people out there because that was just when they were drawn down from Panama. So they couldn't they couldn't have all the people in Panama. So they started standing up that debt and DM and we kind of mm -hmm. got lucky and went out there. But, yeah, most people went to yeah. Fort Bragg. And that's <laughs> what 14. I was hoping for, you know, yeah, I was yeah. hoping to get back out there. And the next thing you know, I get orders to North Carolina and I'm like, wow. <laughs> um, so after graduation, uh, the uh, airborne school, we ended up going to. Uh, we, I say Mikey Brown because that, that dude ended up, him and I ended up doing a lot of schools together and like oh, really? we were in tech school together, survival, airborne. We did air assault together. We did jump master together. I mean, wow. we went to airman leadership school together. There um, you go. So we, we ended up doing a lot of things together. Now he was a few years older than I was. So he had this little different, you know, he had a different outlook on things than I did because I sure. was still pretty young. And so, uh, but, uh, I want to tell a story that I think on, you know, when we were talking about how, how the things have changed through the years of like when we were in and the, and the thought process and the mentality of today, you know, yeah. and just one story that I'll, I'll try and keep it quick, but <laughs> it was, so I flew into St. Louis, linked up with Mikey Brown. And we drove from there to North Carolina oh, Okay, and his little Chevy S 10, right? <laughs> And so we show up to brag again, not knowing what to expect or anything. Right. right? <laughs> and, uh, we show up and we meet uh, a guy by the name of Calvin Swales. I don't know if you knew yep. Calvin Swales. Yeah, I know Calvin. At one time he was the youngest master blaster in the air force. And, and he was like, so proud of that, but you know, <laughs> he was like a senior airman and you know, had it all, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we met like him, Todd Gannon, and here's the thing about Ty Gannon. It probably took me six months to learn that Todd was not even a TAC P <laughs> because right. he was so TAC P, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we meet these guys at the dorms or whatever, and they're like, all right, here's the deal. Get unpack, uh, and then you're going to follow us over to the NCO club at like six o'clock. And then, you know, and then we're going to, we're going to party and then, you know, you got PT at zero seven thirty tomorrow morning. Oh. And we're, we're like, all right. So we we do it, man. So it was like a bunch of the young dudes. So when we got to brag, all the guys had just gotten back. So when I came in for the war, by the time I got there, it was by the time I got done with all my training and everything, it was over. You know, right. it yeah. was way over. Yep. Because I had a little delayed enlistment anyway. So even by the time I, when I joined, the war was already over. Like when I actually went to basic, it was already over. Right, right. Um, so now we get to brag and all these dudes, you know, Kenny Lindsay, uh, Scribner, Mike Lyons. I mean, all these young airmen were all war heroes now. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, they had already been there and they'd done it, you know. Right. And so their mentality was just something different. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I, I didn't, I, it's hard to explain, but these dudes were, in my mind, they were war heroes because they did some cool shit. Right. Um, uh, but they were also had this different mentality, you know, like one, like happy to be home. I don't know. They were, they were just relishing in everything. And you could tell that the morale in the squadron at that time was still pretty high because these dudes were came back and were proud of what they did. Yeah. Yeah. 
but boy, could they party, man. And, <laughs> and I was not, I was not ready for that. So that night we go to the NCO club and I'm not even 21 yet, but it didn't matter, man. No. And, uh, I think I was still 19, 20. Um, and we go to the NCO and, and we like close it down. And so we go to leave and Calvin just tears out of the parking lot. Right. And we don't know how to get back to the dorms. So Mikey <laughs> like tries to follow him. Right. Yeah. And we get pulled over by the cops. Oh no. Day one. We haven't oh. even been there freaking 24 hours. Mikey gets pulled over. Oh right man. Out. And uh cops like comes up and he's like, Hey, uh, license and registration. And Mikey's talking to him and I'm trying to find the registration. I'm, I'm just hammered, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I'm like just handing Mike stuff and Mikey's like, whatever. <laughs> and the dude's like, what are you guys doing here? We're like, dude, this is our first day here. We were trying to follow a dude, but he took off on us and we don't know where we're going. And the cop's like, all right, you go down here, take a left at the stop sign. <laughs> go <laughs> right. And dude, let us go. It was just, I was like, wow. Yeah. And then, so we finally make it back. Oh, to the man. And those dudes are just laughing at us. Yeah, yeah. They're just laughing at us. And then they keep drinking. And I'm like, wow. It's crazy. And then, and Can then, you imagine doing that nowadays? I mean, I, no. I, I think about, I think about days like that where you just drink all night and then you had to like get up the next day or you drove or you had to get up the next day. I couldn't even imagine doing it right now. I just, oh, <sighs> no. And it's, crazy. It, it's just painful to think about. Right. <laughs> right yeah. <laughs> so of course we get up, you know, set, I mean, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half of sleep, two hours. And we get up and we got to meet a, a guy named Orlando Fernando. Yeah. I don't know if you knew or Fernando, but yeah, this I know, dude I know, was I know. an animal. Yeah. You know, back to the I beast. Mean, he was, yeah, he was a little bodybuilder. Like, but he like competed in bodybuilding and he weighed like 160 pounds. And right. he was just, the dude could run, lift, everything. And so we meet him and he just tears us <laughs> up. Just, I mean, I'm puking. I think Mikey's puking. I, I mean, I'm just, and we're just like, there's just like three or four of us. And so he right. knows what he's doing. I think yeah, this yeah. is all a plan, you know? Oh, for sure. For and, sure. Uh, and they just wanted to see what, what we were going to do. You know, <laughs> of course you just drive through and it was just horrible. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, man, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Yeah. Is this, this is, every day? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it almost was I and know, I know. into this rhythm and I was just like, man. So, you know, we just got, uh, you know, but when I was there, man, there was just so many good dudes there. Yeah. I mean, we had Johnny Kleber, McKenzie, Lindsey, um, Lunk ended up showing. I mean, just you talk, Jazz was there. Yeah. Um, and it's just these dudes that were just, our leaders. Yeah. Were just amazing. And yeah, I know we had a we had a reputation for being the the quote unquote jump club, and you know around that time because there we jumped a lot. Sure. A lot. I mean, you were an airborne unit, but that's what you should be doing. Yeah. But you, people don't realize the importance of that. When, when you were just, when we were just jumping as a squadron, you know, sometimes, you know, it was weekly yeah, and it was sometimes a couple days a week, but that proficiency that we had as young airmen, when we had to do the mass tax, dude, it paid, I mean, very seldom did we ever have an injury or somebody in trouble or do something wrong because our proficiency was so high at right. like jumping like T10s, you know, yeah, non-steerable yeah. chutes. We, we learned to steer those chutes. We jump so much, you know, yeah. by you get like a, the risers. You get a feel for it and you know what you're doing mm -hmm. for sure. And that's a good yeah, point because you, there's a lot of there, like, it, and this may be getting off on a tangent real early, but there's a lot of people in, in the military that feel like, oh, well, you're current. You know, you get your jump every quarter and, you, you know, you'll get your pay and that's fine. But it, that has nothing to do with proficiency, like you were saying. I mean, you guys, they used to kind of give us a hard time for wanting to jump more than we did. And I'm like, it's not about, I mean, yeah, it's, sometimes it's fun, but mostly it's about, I don't want to, I want to get out there and do well. You know, it, it's not about just, you know, just getting the paycheck or whatever. I mean, I need to know the ins and outs of it. I need to know, you know, it needs to be just second nature, all that stuff. So yeah, that's yeah, a good point. Exactly, Great point. And that's exactly what it was. It was when, when, you know, I think I ended with over, I can't count the SF, uh, mass tax is really mass tack, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but 
the big army 82nd airborne the 173rd mass tax I, I think i ended with like over 20 something of them Jeez. you know and that's a lot of it is. those type of mass tax and but i go back to all that jumping we did as young airmen and the proficiency that we had because i could come out of the plane and and then and immediately start slipping away from the hundreds of dudes in the air who had no idea that we're getting that one jump a quarter, right. you know, who barely knew what the hell any equipment was on the parachute. So yeah, exactly. Um, so you were at the 14th. Um, how long were you there? How long did you stay at the 14th? So I ended, we got, I got there like October of 91. And then, so, and you know, from then to 94, it was, you know, Get it, you know, that's back when you were Romad for three years and then you go through uh, select, uh, then you go to JTAC QC. We might have went to JTAC QC together too. Possibly. Yeah. That was, it was still at Eglin or I mean, yeah, Herbie went to Jago, Jagos. Yeah. 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 So uh, I think we might have went there together too, beginning with Mikey Brown. And sure. Um, so, you know, and then of course we jumped so many, so much. I'd already been to Jump Master School, Air right. Assault School. Um, so, and a lot of that was, it's, it's not like you were always competing, but you wanted to do good and, in and, and, and you're in their mind to do good, to be that standout airman or just to do your job, getting these schools meant a lot, you know, For sure. uh, that was kind of like my college at the time, you know, yeah, yeah. I was getting all this training and to me, I was getting knowledge. Right. And so for me, that was kind of like my school. Yep. And you probably, you had all those heavy hitters there. You, you, you had oh. to do that to just compete yeah. at their level, you know, or just to be equal. So, and you know, obviously you and some other guys went above and beyond. It was you just... and your boss is Brian Daly. You know? <laughs> right, right. B, BD was my boss. And, oh my gosh. How lucky. And dude, it, just amazing. Yeah. Um, and then Jazz uh, was there who was, yeah, yeah. who ended up, uh, I'll talk more about him in a little bit, but he, he was probably one of my biggest mentors Same in, here. in my career. And, and I know <clears throat> he's probably been, he, I don't even know if he remembers me, but he was to me, you know, that, that dude. And right. I looked up to him immensely. Um, uh, yeah, you're right. There's just so many Lindsay, dude, Lindsay yeah. was just the dude you looked at and was like, I want to be that guy for sure. Cause, cause he was, he was driven. Yeah. You know, and, well, just squared away in every house. way, like yeah. dress and appearance, mission, training, whatever it was, you know, he, he was the, he was the standard, you know, like you just wanted to be, you know, like, that's who I want to be like that guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and what was so cool about all that is you had something, some people like that you revered, like Kenny Lindsay. I, I love that dude. Yeah. But I remember, you know, when it was your birthday, it didn't matter who the hell you were, oh, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I remember Lindsay's birthday and. He came into the, we, we worked in this big hangar. We had cages, right? And every yeah. flight worked in a cage, but it was just this big open hangar. Right. And, uh, he walked in on his birthday and he had like a Kevlar on. He had like a <laughs> flak jacket and he had his blow dart gun. And you're just like, dude, it was like business. It was like time yeah. for business, you know? And, you know, we still got him. You know, yeah. but anyway. Well, it, for people but, that don't know, like <laughs> across, this is why I tell people, I don't tell people my birthday, like even at work now, you know, I'm just, nobody knows my birthday. And I'm because of this, like I witnessed one of these, like it wasn't as bad at DM, but it, we still got kind of worked over. But at the 14th, if they knew oh. it was your birthday, it was, you were going to get just rolled, oh, rolled up. Pink belly, man. For oh. days, dude. And I, I There's witnessed so a couple people. and I was like, man, that is some intense stuff. <laughs> yeah. So that's why like, Kenny came in that day because he was getting ready yeah. to get rolled. Oh, he, well, he had to come in, but he came in prepared. And that's yeah. like you know, you know, long could come in. I mean, baseball bats. I mean, and it's yeah. not like they weren't afraid to use them. They were no, going to no. be used. Yeah. And, uh, but dude, that was just, and that's how we grew up. That was that mentality. It was For just a sure. hundred, uh, just all out. It seemed in everything you did, whether it was a birthday or training or whatever, you know? Right. And, uh, and a lot of that was due to like these NCOs we had that were, I think, trying to make us give us a, a mentality that not only could we, that we would be ready for unexpected stuff at war, you know? Sure. And so it made you tough in a lot of ways. Oh, for I sure. Think both mentally and, and physically. 
Um, so I, you know, I can't, I can't thank the people that were there at that time that helped mold me the way they did. Yeah. Um, so in 94, BD had already left to the ring. So he left to the Rangers before, um, that big initial soft selection. Okay. Right. So they had that very first, when there was a couple of guys who were over at SOCOM, uh, I want to say like Gary Jones, uh, there was only like three or four of them, but then they had that big opening to where they like pulled all these dudes from the career field to go fill the four positions at each SF group. Right. And that killed our squadron. That killed oh, yeah. the, the 14th. I think we might've just got, became the 14th day sauce. We might've still been debt one five Oh seven, but that's where like jazz, um, Larry Patton, Johnny Cleaver, you know, all the dudes that were the, like, did everything for the squadron. Gone. Right. Yeah. Just boof, you know, and, uh, there were still some good dudes there, but just not, not those jazzes, not those sure. Eddie Morales, not the Kenny Lindsay's, you know, right, right. not the Larry Pat and just like, boom. And, and there were still some really good dudes there. I mean, Chris Griffin, I mean, I can just go on with the names of the, these guys that they pulled from our, and it just. Really, it was like, man, they took every dude. Right. <laughs> um, and so in that time, you know, I had gotten, uh, I, I was, I was still kind of young. Right. And so yeah. the crew I ran with was, they were 110 miles an hour. Right. And I can't remember, I think it was, it might've been Larry Patton that pulled me aside one day and he's like, dude, he's like, you got to make, he, he's like, you, you're, I, we might've even gotten can't remember we might have gotten a little trouble or something and he like pulls me aside and he's like hey dude here this is where your why comes in the road he's like you can you can continue on where you're going have a great time yeah you know and and by this time i was already i was married you know um and i had my wife jenny uh there with me and and so it was like and i was still trying to hang out with these younger you know with my with my peer group but right. they were still just, and so he's like, here at your why. He's like, some people have it later in the career. Some people have it earlier in the career. He's like, it's just, this is your time. You know? Yeah. He's like, you got to decide what you want to do. So I started like really buckling down and focusing on the job. Uh, and that's when after that initial soft selection, the next year, I think it was 94, the end of 94, they did a, they said, okay, we're going to do the first physical selection. Oh, okay. And I was a young, I was a senior airman and, uh, I was a new JTAC. And so I went up to, I think it was senior master sergeant Reese. And I told him I wanted to try out for selection. He was over at SOCOM now. Oh, okay. And I, and he's like, no, nope. he's like, you can't go through selection. He's like, you're a senior airman. You have to be an E5. Mm -hmm. and so I just kept bugging him. And I kind of, I got to the point where I was like, well, and they didn't have a big turnout. Yeah. Like, they only had a couple of packages. I don't know if you know, rock Kevin Davis. For, yeah, for sure. Rock was, rock was one. And then another guy named Sepesniak, Greg Sepesniak. Yep. Yep. Uh, six pack. You're right. Those are like the only two dudes that have put in a, a package. And so I just kept bugging Reese. And I was like, I was like, let me just try out. So that way, when I do make staff sergeant. I'll know what I'm looking at and, sure. uh, you know, be prepared. And I think after, you know, them not having the numbers that they were expecting maybe, or I don't know what it was. He just finally gave in. He's like, all right. He's like, you can try out, but you're not, you don't meet the qualifications. So right. just so you know, this is, you're just going through the motions and I'm like, perfect. You know? Right. Uh, so I put in my package and I went through that, that very first, very first physical selection because they had already hired all the studs in the prior one. Right. Right. And, uh, and so there was only three of us, me rock and uh six pack and dude, it was, you know, for the first one, it was hellacious. I mean, yeah. Um, stuff that was way above me. I mean, we had, we had these, t they gave us these tests about with laser stuff on them back in, you know, 94, 95, who knew anything about lasers, dude. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking about different spectrums of laser. And I'm like, really? we got to know this. Yeah, right. I was just like, wow. And, yeah. Um, 
and then you know our we, of course we did the swim we did the ruck march and all and so through all the physical stuff i was doing really well because i yeah. was still young and i was yeah. in great shape and so i was like doing really well on it and then um you know these tests man they were they were kicking my ass but then we would do like lit naps and i don't know if those the guys who are initial cadre, like the Tim Stamies and yeah. and those dudes, actually walked those lanes. I think they just like went out and put <laughs> one point here and another point here. But some of them were like seven clicks long, man. And oh my god! The shit we had to walk through was ridiculous. yeah, yeah. It wasn't just like walking on flat ground. It was like <laughs> no. the, the deep I, woods. I remember Rock and I. There was like this one. There's this one point we were supposed to go to, and it was so bad that, um, you know, I ended up you know, vectoring around the thick stuff. And I ended yeah. up, you know, walking the roads a little bit. And I think sure, I got yeah. caught, but Stavey was pretty cool and yeah, didn't yeah. bust me. But um, I get, we get back to the the camp for the night and Rock and I are talking and Rock's like, man, did you go through that, man? I, he's like, I went around it. But I think he got caught. He did get caught by Stavey. But um, <laughs> I was like, no. Well, as we're like doing all this stuff, dude, six packs lost gets oh like, no yeah you because know, he decides he's gonna go straight through this thing and oh. dude, he's like so like that changes everything you know like two or three hours are looking for him and uh <laughs> so but we ended up going through that so uh, going through the selection at the end they kind of back then it was really they they took all the cadre which was all the group guys so jazz tommy king eddie morales uh, Tim Stamey, Reese, those were the dudes that made the decision. It wasn't like, you know, there was some, you know, they give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Right. Right. And, uh, so I think, I, I guess, I don't know what happened. They got to my name and there were some dudes that were like, no, uh, he did, he did all right. You know, I, you know, I wasn't, I know the testing I wasn't great on, but <laughs> they were like, he did pretty good. But then a couple guys were like, well, he did good enough, but he doesn't meet the qualifications because he's only a senior airman. And we said, you yeah. have to be a staff sergeant. And so I don't know whether they needed the numbers or they said, Hey, we can make this kid something. He, you know, if we put some work into him, yeah. he, he'll be all right. So I ended up getting selected as a senior. Nice. Airman. Um, so I kind of, I don't want to boast and brag, but I think I might've changed the rules a little bit, Sure, you know, um, and it had a, allowed that opened it up to these senior airmen to go try out. I, yeah, I don't yeah. know, but that's a, I made it as a senior airman at a time. No, I think you're right. I, I mean, I, I know what kind of a hard charger you were and are, and I, I, I could see that. That doesn't surprise me a bit that they would pick you. I think you impressed them enough and they're like, you know what? We, yeah, it should be a staff sergeant, but this kid is crushing it. So, and he's, he's meeting all the standards. So yeah, I let him in. I mean, I could totally see that happening for sure. Yeah. But they may have needed the numbers too. I don't, you know. Nah. <laughs> uh, Maybe. So, because <laughs> they only had three dudes try out. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so I, I ended up, so 90, I think it was 94, 94, 95, I ended up going over to seventh group. Okay. And that's where I reconnected with uh, Griff, um, Jazz, Stamey, and then Tommy King. And then Gary Jones was there. Uh, and then Gary Jones, I think Jonesy ended up and Tommy ended up going up to SOCOM. So it was like me, Jazz, Griff, and Six Pack, I want to say. We're at seventh group. And then over at third group, so we were all underneath the, what they called at the time the 22nd ASOF. Right. And the ASOF was, we had the SOCOM dudes and then the two SF groups that fell underneath that. Okay. And the 22nd ASOF was the only flight that fell under directly underneath the group. So we okay. fell underneath the ASOC. Every every other SF group of TAC P's out there would fall underneath the corresponding squadron. Oh, okay. So the fifth group guys fell underneath the 19th. Okay. Um, uh, and then, you know, like the 10th group guys fell underneath the 13th. Well, yeah, yeah. for us, we fell directly underneath the group. So whoever was, you know, we had a, a Captain Chestnut, I think it was. He was our ALO uh, up at SOCOM with Tommy King or, or Reese and those, those guys, they, they had the direct ear to the group commander nice. you know, of the 18th day saw. And so we got, we, we, you know, we were able to get good equipment. We were small, so it was very manageable for us to do what we need to do. And we had the group commander's ear. Yeah. 
not like you know you were just another flight of a squadron that was that nobody really knew about because you know you were still dislocated because you were at an SF group and sure. come over to the squadron for commanders calls or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was and almost a, probably kind of like a burden kind to that squadron because you're like off doing your own thing, but you're still on their numbers. So they're like, man, these guys are off doing you know. Not that it, yeah. So I could yeah I could see how yeah, you guys and, would have a, a better line for sure. Yeah, and think about it as you know, as you progress your career, and when you're a squadron superintendent and you're working for your commander, and you have this flight, you're you like, dude, they fall under us. We were responsible for them, you know. Yeah. You got to yeah. know what they're doing, but then you, you you're not trying to get in their chili, but you got to know what their chili is, and then the sure. dudes are like, dude, what are you doing, man? I know, yeah. You know? And they're trying to keep you out of their chili, yeah. you know. Like, yeah, we're, exactly. we're doing our own thing. We're we're taking care of business, and right, right. They were, but you still yeah. have this responsibility as a superintendent and a squadron commander to sure. know what those dudes are doing. <clears throat> so I got over to seventh group and I, I pretty much ended up working uh, for jazz nice. and jazz. One of my first conversations with jazz was, is he was like, all right, here's the deal. He's like, dude, if, if you need to be at work, you're at work. He's like, I expect you to work your ass off. He's like, but. I don't want you sitting around here in the office doing nothing. Yeah. There's nothing to do. He's like, you're going to be second battalion JTAC. And so I had, you know, seventh group, second battalion was my group of dudes. And, um, that I was supposed to train and go do, uh, training with and stuff. And mm -hmm. he's like, like you, it's your, he's like, it's, your, and that's what I loved about him, man. He's like, this is your world. You, you do what you need to do. So I, he let me like, he opened me up for that. So, I mean, I was out, you know, with ODAs training and, and there's a, I, I don't, it's not a misconception because this is the way it, it was supposed to be. You know, like we were there to train them on emergency cast. That was right. the, that was the same, you know, mm -hmm. if anybody was like, what's your job? Well, we were, we're here to train ODAs and emergency cast, but in reality, we were there to be the fires guy for right. that team or for that battalion. We were the fires guy. They didn't have fires dudes at that time. Yeah. Um, we were all organic fires were your responsibility. Right. So you go to a JRTC, you would be in, you know, the talk and you were the fires guy. They, you know, you had all this shit going on with all the fire stuff. And then if a TGO mission came down, like for training, they would pull you and stick you with that they would isolate you with that ODA and now you were the JTAC on that team that was going to perform terminal guidance operations nice so you were supposed to be just this training guy but in overall you were much much more sure. and so my time at seventh group I was I had the opportunity to do some really cool stuff down in South America that I, I wouldn't even say is JTAC oriented you know right. it was just these training and not even I'd say, yeah, I think they were mostly all called training, but we were doing things that were definitely not training down there. Right. But just these opportunities. And I give all that, that credit to like jazz of allowing me to do that. Not, um, saying this is your lane. He was like, dude, this is, you know, the lane is this wide, not this wide. Right. right. You, you do whatever's in that spectrum. And, and so I just, you know, I just re respected that dude so much for how he treated me then and yeah. i don't know i i have to ask him but i think he's one of the guys that initially gave me the thumbs down because i didn't make the call you know i was oh, yeah. i was a senior <laughs> airman you know right, right i wasn't a staff sergeant and so i didn't know if he was trying to, in the beginning to see if i was going to sink or swim you know because he Maybe, put a yeah. lot of give you enough rope put, to hang yourself kind of thing yeah he put yeah. a lot on me in the beginning and uh but he always supported me too yeah like it's not like he was ever not once did he like try and set me up for failure. Yeah. I don't, he I was, think, I he think was he was doing that. Success yeah. Oh, for sure. I doing. think that's what he was doing was like, you know, he, he's a great leader. I mean, he understands that yeah. empowering your troops is better than micromanaging them. And he was like, well, the guy's here, even if he gave you a thumbs down initially, he's like, you're, he's here. Yeah. He squared away. He obviously made this selection. So he's going to treat you yeah. like everybody else. And that's, and that's what he did, man. And so he kind of took me under his wing and I just, I learned tremendously from that dude. I learned from, uh, you know, those other guys, Stamey and Griff immensely also. Oh yeah. Um, and so I, I was just a serious growing period for me. 
And it, you know, remember what I was talking about? That was my time to, you know, when I think it was Patton talking to me about the why in the road. Sure. That was it for me because dude, that was a sense of responsibility that, you know, now it was, it was all about big boy being a big boy at that time. You know, nobody yeah, yeah. was looking over you to make sure you were doing this. It was like, you're taking care of business because that's your job. And so I grew tremendously in that, nice. in that arena. And, you know, of course, you know, I just, Lindsay was over at third group. Brock was over at third group. Eddie Morales is over at third group. Um, and, but we were all still like in this one flight. So, I mean, just the dudes that I had there with me yeah. were just, it was so amazing, man. Yeah. This is an amazing time in my life. But I think I had been over there. I wasn't over there that long when we got a call from a guy. Did you know Keith Ingram? Yeah. yeah he's my first supervisor. So, was he? Yeah. So Keith, I think, had moved up to 10th group and was the NCIC yeah. at 10th group. And I think right. it was like him and Johnny Knight. I can't remember who else was there. But uh, Johnny was supposed to be going over to Bosnia. Okay. And I think he had a train, he got hurt training, got some injury training. Uh, and so we got a call. And they're like, hey, Sean, you're going to Bosnia. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, <laughs> holy crap, you know? <laughs> Uh, I think 96, 97. So, I mean, I was, I was still pretty wet behind the ears, you know, yeah. no, no real experience with, uh, anything. I just other couple trips down South America, but, um, I ended up going over to Bosnia and doing the JCO mission, the joint commission observer mission, which was okay. totally crazy. I don't know if you knew anything. I'm not familiar that. with it. No. So what it was, was, so you have these ODAs spread out among all over Bosnia, right? And you, know, yeah. you were in a safe house and their job was like, take like a Bosnian, uh, Croat and a Serb. Right. And so let's say the, the police chief of a town was Bosnian Croat and the mayor was a Bosnian Serb, right? They hated each other. Sure. So these, the team's job was to kind of get them together and start having these then work together kind of like, oh, okay. you know, it was like this whole FID type stuff. And, but it was really getting these different people who were just got done killing each other to work together. Okay. And it was, it was kind of crazy, you know, I was so, going to say that's, that's a hard mission, man. Dang, um. Yeah, it was, it was difficult, man. And so my job was to go out to all these safe houses and work on their E and E plans. So, uh, and that you know, and entailed like bringing in AC one thirties and, and, you know, Hey, we're getting overrun. What's, what are we doing? So I bring AC one thirty over, we would have, you know, our quick reaction force come in and then we would extract, you know, okay. so we, that was my job was to do this training. I was supposed to jump around to each team. So I was like all over Bosnia. I think the base camp was Banya Luka and, uh, but then, so I'd stay there and then I go out to a team and then I come home. Well, I ended up really getting in really good with one team to where I ended up starting going to these meetings and stuff with them. And, uh, nice. and so I kind of found a home and I, from there, I would just like go out to the other teams and I would always come back to this team house. Oh, okay. And that was just like really cool, man. It was, you know, we were just living in some, we had this huge farmhouse uh, that we lived at and that we lived in and. Every morning, you know, you had this routine. You'd go get your interpreters and bring them back. We had a dude on the team. He cooked breakfast every morning. Nice. Big ass, big ass breakfast. You know, just <laughs> eggs, bait, you name it, dude. And <laughs> your job when you went to go pick up the interpreters, come back with fresh loaves of bread, man. Oh, okay. And so, <laughs> and dude, we, I ate like an animal there because <laughs> when we go out to eat too, you, you couldn't you couldn't spend your daily per diem because everything was just so cheap. So we had right, like right. five course meals with wine and, and it was just crazy. And you just, you know, it costs like 30 euro or whatever, you know, right, it's just yeah. nothing. Um, <laughs> and then they would throw these big parties to get all these diplomats together. So, yeah. you you know, these house, some of these houses were like mansions that the teams are staying in. They have pools and they would throw these huge parties and, that's the first time that I was, it was, uh, I want to say it was like the 4th of July. And so the one of the, the team started and one of the teams I was with, he wanted to, to roast a pig for 4th of July. 
Nice. So we went to a farm and there's a pig there. And, and he's like, Hey man, uh, you ever kill a pig before? I like, no. He's like, oh, now's your time. So that's like the first time <laughs> I got, you know, I killed yeah. a pig and then we ate it, you know, but it was just like crazy stuff like that. And it, that was a cool thing to do. And that's, that's where I ended up getting uh, my nickname diesel is oh, on yeah. that, d- that deployment. Um, so when we would go back to Banya Luca to refit and get food and stuff like that, uh, the Brits had Bonnie Luca. The Brits pretty much own that base. And so yeah. back then they would have like all each like little unit would have their own little bar. Okay. And so like we would go to the, the military, British military police bar and you'd have a beer or two. And it's not like we were like partying hard or anything, but you go and you're like making connections for, you know, sure. just so you get to meet people. And so as we started going to these little bars, there'd be like, the Brits, man, they always, you know, them and the Americans always have this competition no matter yeah. what. And, right, right. and so they would be like, all right, so, you know, I get dared. So the, I think the first one was like an arm wrestling competition. Yeah. And so I started arm wrestling these dudes and then it got to the point to where they were getting mad because I was winning. And then they, <laughs> they went and woke some dude up to come arm wrestle me. And that's when I was like, I was like, call on the ringer. Yeah. I was like, here's the deal. I was like, if I'm going to do this, I was like, anytime we come to this bar, we drink for free. And so that became the deal. And so uh, I ended up winning. And so that every time we would go to that bar, our, our beers are free, right? <laughs> nice. So then we go to another, we go to another one and they had like this big ass, uh, tree stump. It was like 22 stone. I can't remember. It was like heavy as heck, you know? And yeah. Yeah. It's like, they call it stone. So I couldn't tell you how heavy it was, but it had like bark on it and everything still. And so they started daring me again, you know, and I don't know, I must've had this look on my face. Like I was, and it, you know what I mean? Like somebody yeah. dare me to, I had no, no idea. <laughs> uh, so they were like, all right, you got to hold this stump up with your arms and you know, and the, the record's 19 seconds. And I'm like, well, if I beat that, then every time we come to this bar, we drink for free. And they're just like, okay, whatever, you know, no, yeah. no problem. So I do it and I, I beat the record, you know, and so it's just kept going on. Then uh, yeah, yeah. the team guys start calling me Mac Diesel. They're like, Mac Diesel, come on. So that now that the team starts bringing me to these places just so I can do these, these things. These feats of strength, these yeah, challenges. And, and so I think the last one was that I remember was, well, there's two. One, I got, I got, they put me in the suit and I got chased down by the SAS dogs. Okay. <laughs> they, they sick like three of them on me. But <laughs> the other one was we were with, with the SAS dudes and they were doing these bungee cords. So they put a beer on a cone, tie you off to a bungee cord on the end of a Jeep. Yeah. And you yeah. had to run out and grab the beer before the bungee cord pulled you back. Right. Right. So again, the team starts hyping me up, you know, and, and then, uh, so the SAS dudes are all right, Mug. So they take this cone and they tie me up and everything, and I'm getting ready to do it. And I was like, well, if I do this, anytime we come here, we drink for free. And they're like, okay. So they take the cone and they move the cone farther away. And they're like, okay, it's a deal. So yeah. now I've got to do it, you know. So I oh, ended yeah. up doing this. And and it was like, so from that point on, I was like, diesel was because they're like, dude, you just knack diesel, baby. I don't know how to st- <laughs> So that was, that was a cool thing for me, but <laughs> dude, what a, that was a crazy time. That was, yeah, that was a yeah. lot of fun though. But yeah, I think, so that's when I just had the twins too. So I, I have to ensure, so I had my twin, my, my, well, I didn't have the twins. My wife had the twins. Sure, and yeah. so I deployed to Bosnia when they were like six months old. Oh man. Or something like that. How long were you over there? Uh, like six, uh, six months, five months, okay. five, six months. So they're like completely um, different kids when you get back for sure. Yeah. I, mean, I, I missed, six you know, months, I missed, I, mean, I missed their first birthday, you know, and, <clears throat> and that's where this all comes back into play. Like when I saw you a minute ago, like that's the important shit because we oh, yeah. miss so much stuff. Um, and I can't give my wife enough accolades and credits, you know, dude, July 2nd will be. 29 years that we've been together nice and that's for her awesome, to stick man. with me through all this uh get you emotional man because for sure yeah the, what she did was amazing 
yeah way harder than anything i feel like i've ever done uh oh know? yeah i mean you guys are lucky i mean it, it's it's it really is fortunate for I got you know for you two to find each other and have this kind of relationship where she can hang in there and take care of everything while you're gone and doing doing the mission. So yeah, man, that's awesome. I love love to hear yeah. it. Yeah. So just so happy and grateful for her. Yeah. Um, okay, so you were in Bosnia for six months. Um, yeah. Come back from yeah, Bosnia. So what, All's good. Yeah. Now now I've got some you know some some more experience. Sure. Uh, and then just you know continue to do the, the thing at Seventh Group until. Uh, 99. And so I, you know, at seventh group, I got a lot of, a lot of training. One of the, I got the one thing I was able to go to SODIC, uh, from there, which was, you know, the special operations target interdiction course. Um, they gave that to me. I don't know if it was because rock took my freaking halo jump master slot again, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but SODIC but, is like, uh, it's a sniper course. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's okay. the, it's the SF sniper course. So, which um, is, which is unique. I mean, I don't, not a lot of people get that and that's a, it's very uh, no, commendable. Think, it's a, it's not easy. I mean, it's a, that's commendable that you made it through that for sure. Yeah. And it's not, you know, and I wasn't a person made for that, you know, it was, uh, um, I think six pack got to go six pack and I both went through it and, um, you know, I was not a big hunt. Like Stamey went through it, and that was for Stamey because Stamey right. is just an amazing shot as it is. You know, and so he's comfortable uh, in that kind of situation. For yes, sure. you know, and so he is a rock star in that, and he he I guarantee he shined during that course. Oh, for sure. But for me, you know, I I learned because that wasn't dude just stalking and all the all the, the nuances of shooting, and it was just amazing for me. So. Yeah. I, it all kind of comes back later on, but you get these courses when you're in and you don't really think anything of it at the time, but in the, in the, in the end, it kind of all circles back around. Sure. You know, yeah, yeah. you can take these things that you've learned and you're going to end up using them in it for real. Right. Uh, so, um, so in 99, I ended up going to got pop for Korea. Okay. So my four years was up, uh, you know, cause at that time in the soft side, you have four, you were coded for four years and then your code gets lifted and then now you're open. Yeah, and I was like one of the vulnerable only, for sure. Yeah. I was like yeah. one of the only dudes at Bragg period that hadn't been to Korea yet, you know? Yeah. So my code got, I think my code got lifted. And so there shortly after I went to Korea, did my year in Korea again, I go over with all, man, I show up. Larry Patton's there, freaking, yeah. you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, man, Griff's there, Rockin's up showing up. It's oh just my like, God. man, it was like brag minus, you know? It was like right. all the, uh, so we had a great time there. It was just good time. And I was with the Air Assault Battalion uh, there. So, nice. and then I was, I was able to, I had like three dudes under me. So I was, I was kind of felt good because now I'm, now I'm, because on the soft side, there was nobody for me to mentor or to, sure. to lead. Right. So now I have these young kids underneath me and now I get to give them a little bit of what I had. Yep. And so just taking these kids out on these air assault missions and, you know, three, four day things and just letting them learn and just, it just amazed me how awesome these young dudes were, you know, yeah, uh, you know, and <laughs> So I had this one kid, he's, he's at the JTAC QC course now. Um, he's an instructor there, uh, but he was, he was from Louisiana, right? Just yeah. down, down, just down to earth kid, man. And he, so I take him out for this like three day mission and aerosol. And, you know, our mindset is like your rucksack is for like food and freaking radios and, right. and so he's like comes to me with like a a sleeping bag he's like sarge i need and i was like dude take you ain't taking that you don't need that <laughs> all right you need you got your wooby and your poncho that's all you need yeah um so we get out there and it starts raining on us and it's cold <laughs> and so i'm to the point to where i'm like it's like starting to be like survival mode and i'm like yeah I'm like hey bro we're going to have to spoon. And he's like, Oh no. <laughs> he's like, no way. I was like, yeah, bro, we're, we're, we're going to live through this one, man. So yeah, <laughs> but just that whole thing of like me, 
you know, making these mis- you know, I, I, and of course the, the, the little the group we're with and dudes, they all have their sleeping bags. You know? Oh, they did. <laughs> 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 so just me making these stupid mistakes just because it was like how I, you know, it's what, it's what BD would have told me. You know? Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. You don't need that. Let's yeah. Go. You're supposed to be hard. You can handle it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so learning, I was also learning at the time, on, yeah. you know, how to be a good uh, supervisor and, and leader. Uh, so, but just so that was a good time. I was blessed to have the people there and in, in Korea that we didn't. You know, it was a standard, nothing, nothing crazy. You yeah. Know? Um, we were up in uh, Camp Casey. Okay. So nothing crazy, man. It was, it was Korea. You yeah. get there, and you go to a fog for three or four months and you get ready for your mid tour, come home and then you right. come back and try and get something accomplished the last six months. And, you know. Yeah. It goes so, by uh, quick. Yeah, it did. Um, again, another year away from the family though, you know. Yeah. Kind of so. I wanted, I went back. So because I'd already been through a physical selection, I just, I think they told me all I had to do was the paper selection to go back to the soft side of the house. Okay. Um, so I did that, uh, and then ended up, uh, coming back to 10th group at Carson. I got back, uh, in 2000, uh, yeah. And then. So I came back to 10th group and now I'm part of that 13th day sauce. You know, we're, we're, we're living in at, over at 10th group, but we're still part of the 13th day sauce. Right. And, uh, so yeah, I go there and I'm part of the second battalion there. And so that's where we had, uh, I don't know. Chet McClend was the NCIC there. Okay. <sighs> Phenomenal dude. Phenomenal. Yeah. I'd never even heard of the dude before. Yeah. Um, I'm not even sure I've met him. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. What, what, a, what a guy, man. Really? Just another phenomenal leader. Yes. But nice. in a totally different aspect, he was probably the first dude that started showing me about, um, taking care of yourself and your family is, is so yeah. important. You know, he just had this like peace of mind thing, dude, to where, calm cool and collected and internal type thing yeah, yeah. and he was and and the dude was tough as nails i mean he was just tough but you would never know because he was so kind-hearted and and nurturing you know yeah, yeah. but man what a, he was another great leader and so uh got had the opportunity to work under him and and learn a lot from him and again just doing you know the standard uh SF training stuff, you know, level one train ups, and then, you know, or you just go set up the training for CAS. And and mm-hmm. now I think we're getting more to where it's expected that we're the JTAC on the team. Sure. Um, yeah. And we're still the fire. You're still the expert in fires. Right. So, right. um, so that's, and it was, it was pretty uneventful until, uh, nine 11, you know? And, um, I think, you know, that morning I was, we were supposed to have night air on that day. And so I was, I was still at the house and I get a call and they're like, Hey, you watching TV? And I'm like, yeah. And you know, it's all, you know, the towers thing is going on. So uh, I get dressed, go in. It takes like, you know, I'm sure you guys experienced the same thing. It took like hours to get on base. Well, I, luckily I was already at work and then, yeah, but the, the other guys, we're just stuck in traffic the whole way. I mean, yeah. Benning was shut down and like the highway would come, coming into Benning was just a, tra- a parking lot at that point. Yeah. So probably the same way there you guys. Yeah. So, and, and we get in and of course we get these briefs, you know, after hours and, you know, and they're like, go home, you know, and we're like, we, you may be way here for like six hours. We ain't going to... <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so now it's like, what, what's going to happen? Cause you just right. had this feeling that something's, you know, that there there's chess pieces being moved around. Sure. And so, yeah, was, I don't know if it was even a week later or, or a couple of weeks later, maybe, uh, we get, I get, a, I, this guy comes into the office and he's like, Hey, there's a call on, on the secure phone for you. And I was like, Oh, okay. So I go over and I go into the skiff or whatever. And it's, uh, Colonel Longoria. 
Okay. You know, you know, Longoria, right? Yeah, he's been on here. Yeah. I had him on here. Uh, yeah, for an interview. That dude, man, amazing Great, man, awesome guy. Yeah, Great I guy. love that guy. Yeah. So, and he's like, so he's at the time he's the 18th ASOL commander, so he's right. still got the the grip on what's going on. Plus, you know, he got the 20 the 22nd ASOL is still up and running. Yep. And so he was there when I was at the 22nd ASOL. So like, I think. I don't know if he knew me well, but I think he just needed a point of contact where we sure. were. So he called me. He's like, Hey, I need you and a couple of guys, uh, to pack your stuff and get to brag ASAP. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So I go in, and, uh, I grab, uh, tell, uh, Billy Burgum and Ray Garotti were there over at 10 okay. group. And, um, I tell them the deal and they're like, all right. So essentially we have like these blanket orders that they created yeah. for us. Uh, we pack everything. Um, we don't even know what's going on. We just like take everything we have in our lockers pretty much and put them in, you know, the cases and go to brag. Yeah. And we show up at brag. Uh, the guys from a couple of dudes from the 22nd ace off pick us up and they're like, all right, all right we're going to take you to REI. We're going to do some shopping. <laughs> and you pick out what you got. And I'm like, like, what are we getting? They're like, yeah. what do you, what do I need? Yeah. Got? Dude, nobody knows any right, of this, right. right? So we're like, you know, we're getting watches <laughs> we're getting, uh, <laughs> you know, clothes, you know, I think uh, the five, you know, like the cargo pants and sure, sure. shirts and sweatshirts, and big fleece pullovers, uh, GPS, you know, Garmin's. Yeah, uh, the E-Trex garments, and we're just getting all this stuff, and we have no clue. And then I think it was we were at Bragg for like two or three days, and then we're we're on a plane. And I I really don't still think I got any orders. <laughs> right. It was it was just Colonel Longoria making things happen. Oh yeah, yeah. Like he he didn't wait to be told anything. Like he was no. like, this is he. He knew what had to be done, and he was like, "All right, let's start moving some guys. Let's do it." And yeah, he yeah. Was a phenomenal he was, leader. He, he had the he had the ability to. He knew people. Yeah. So he could get. He was able to get things done, man. And, right. And I, I, I truly believe, and I, I believe, if it wasn't for him, Tack Peace would have missed out on a lot of that fight. Hundred percent. Uh. So. Hundred percent. And because he, he just he made it happen, and he, dude, he didn't hesitate. Right. So next thing you know, we're on, we're on our way to, to Uzbek, you know, so yeah. uh, show up there and we weren't the first guys there. There were already rock and beef and there's already a lot of jazz was, I think already there. So a lot of dudes were already there and dudes had already been pushed out to teams and, and yeah. to isolation uh, that were just still sitting there. And so I think the plan was for you get in, you get settled and then they find a team for you. And then you get put on a team, go into isolation. Well, for for me, uh, that didn't happen. Oh, really? I think we were there for like two or three days, and so some of the initial teams that they had pushed out, they pushed out without JTAX on them. Okay. Uh, hey, and, real quick before we get too far down, uh, you yeah. keep mentioning isolation. I. I, from the Ranger world, we never really did anything like that. Can you talk about that? Or is that something that you don't really talk about? Like, what, what do you mean? Like, I kind of think I know what that means, but I don't know if you want to go yeah. into it real quick. No. Yeah. It's just so, so when they put, when they take you, like, let's say you got um, a contingency operation going on, what they'll do is they'll take the, the teams, the ODAs and isolate the teams from everybody else. Yeah. So they, they put you alone to where you don't know what's going on with the other teams. I think a lot of it's plausible deniability so okay. that you don't have the full picture of what's going on. But, and when you're in isolation, you have this mission set and you're like, okay, this is what our target is. This is what we're, this is what our mission is going to be. And so you start planning why you're in isolation. You're the whole thing, you know, like, Hey, what's yeah. our infill plan, blah, blah. And it's just used an ODA, like who we're going to be working with when we go in there. Um, but it kind of keeps you separated from everybody else. So, uh, and are you like cut off from like, there's no phones. I mean, there's no, yeah. no, you're, no you're contact with the outside in. world. You're kind of yeah, no focused con, on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're like locked down. It's gotcha. Like, it's, it's a, you and the dude you're going to be with for how, you know, uh, so a lot of guys were already in those positions and they were already okay. isolated. And 
but for me, it, it wasn't like that. Oh so, no, <laughs> no, because uh, um, so they uh, there were teams. Like I said, there were teams. I think that went out without any JTAX. Okay, and so I. I don't think they were getting very good BDA when they were calling in strikes. Gotcha. So they were like, Hey, we need to fix remedy to this. We need to fix it. Uh, so we're going to take JTAX and throw them all in with the teams that are already out there. And so that's what happened to me. They came up and they're like, Hey, can you be ready to go within like 16 hours or 12 hours or something like that? I know it was that day that they came to me. And say, hey, can you be ready to go like tonight? And I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah, I had no. <laughs> oh my gosh, you went so from then, like getting a phone call in Colorado to not knowing anything, moving to Bragg, not knowing anything, going to Uzbek, still not knowing anything, and you're like, okay, get ready to go. It's like, what is going on? Oh yeah, dude, it, it, and and it's, and I still have no. I, I'm just like along for the ride, man. Right. <laughs> but everything I'm doing is a totally new experience, right? It's yeah. Like, and I never had dreamed in my life that, you know, when I was, you know, 16 years old, hanging out in Colorado Springs, I'd be doing anything like this, you know? Right. So they linked me up with a, with a combat controller, Tracy Martin, a dude, great dude. He was a yeah. guard CCT guy. Um, but they link us up together and they're like, you guys are going in together. You guys are going to be on the same team. I'm like, all right. So, you know, like, first time I meet him, we shake hands. And they're like, all right, go over here and get your comm set. Go over here and get this. Go over there and get. And so him and I are just like running around, man. Just like <laughs> we, I look at him. I'm like, dude, you know what's going on? He's like, I have no clue what's going on. You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, but dude, he's in, he's in it just like me. Like he's sure. ready to go. And uh, next thing you know, we're sitting, we're like getting on the back of an MC-130. And this Intel guy comes up to us. And he's got this folder of like maps and he just hands them to us. He's like, all right, so where you're going is like this many freaking bad dudes and this and that. And I'm like, what? And he's like, and your E and E plan is, and we're on the back of the MC 130 engines are turning. Oh my God. <laughs> and you see me and Tracy are trying to write it down. We're like, Hey, we're not supposed to be writing this down. Cause if we get covered, <laughs> you know, but we're <laughs> doing what we can. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the, another guy comes up and he's just handing us ammo, right? And we're just like, what is going on? So we get on the plane and uh, I look down and I still have like my regular boots on. I didn't grab my winter boots, you know? Oh, no. And I was like, dang it. And that, that's all I could think about. I was like, dude, my feet are going to fall off. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we didn't, you know, when we started packing up, we started like grabbing helmets and uh, by arm and they're like, don't take any of that. You don't have room for it. Oh so we God. didn't have any, any of that. It was just like, I had an A bag, a, a, a bag, like maybe it was two. No, it was an A bag and a rucksack pretty much is all I had. Yeah. And, and I had a little box with, I don't even know if I had that. It was as minimal equipment, Sure. just a big ass ruck and, uh, and an A bag, maybe two A bags. You know, and so we get on MC-130 and I don't even know where we're going, man. I have, I have no clue. They just said, hey, you're going to go show up at this point. You're going to link up with an ODA. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> and Tracy's the same way. Um, so we, we take off. We fly for a little while. We land. And it's pitch black. And it, it's pretty much just him and I and like five other people on this MC-130, right? That's it, that's it. Wow. And we land and we get off the back and it's pitch black. I I couldn't tell you where we were to this day. I, I don't know where we were. Um, and so now him and I are just standing there with our gear. And we're like, whoa, we don't, nobody told us who to link up with. Right. And, and uh, some guy walks over and he's like, hey are you Sean Tracy? And we're like, yeah. And he, I think he said minion, minion and Tracy. And we're like, yeah. He's like, come with me. So we <laughs> grab our stuff, walk over to uh, MH 53. <laughs> oh my God. You weren't even like, there yet. Right. <laughs> yeah. They're like, here we go. They're like, get on. And so now it's just me and Tracy on this MH 53 and we take off, man. We're fucking, we're flying. And, uh, <laughs> and then next thing you know, I, I hear it. 
they, I guess they were tweaking the guns, you know, on the back. And, and I thought, man, it's, we're in it. You know, and all he was doing is <laughs> just tweaking his guns. <laughs> but I thought for sure we were in it. And, uh, uh, so I think we flew for maybe an hour and a half, two hours. And then geez. maybe more. I, I don't, it wasn't that long. It was, it was a little bit to where we didn't really know what was going on. Next thing I know is like they give us the five minutes out and then one minute and they come into land and they didn't even touch the ground, man. They just open up the tailgate and they get close. And I remember me and we're running off and I have my weapon strapped around me and I got my A bag and got my rucksack and I go to step off the back of the tailgate and these dudes are already taken off. So they just send me in a flip. So oh I just my like God. do like this flip and I'm on the ground. I'm holding on to my stuff still. And Tracy's already like, 50, 50 feet away, man. That dude was on it. Yeah. Um, so he runs back, grabs me. We like go off to the side and we try and find this like little ditch. And there's like nobody there. Nobody. And we're you had no there. idea where you were. And is this the no, middle of nowhere? In the middle of nowhere. Oh and God. and uh, I'm, him and I are looking at each other and we're like, dude, I thought somebody was supposed to be here. You know, and or like, and now we're like, dude, they dropped us off at the wrong spot. There's nobody here. Um, and there wasn't anybody there. And so now it's getting to be like 15 minutes in. We had just gotten our pace plan hours ago. And so now we're trying to get SATCOM up to try and call back to see. And, you know, back then they hadn't moved the satellites straight overhead. So you had to have a good azimuth and angle on right. your sat antenna to, to even make comms. And so we're trying, I mean, we're doing, we can't get hold of anybody and we're out there. I'm like, dude, we're going to have to start E and E and like no clue what the heck. So I think we we're probably there maybe 20, 25 minutes. And then we see some headlights pop over this hill and drive them. So we like run, get down, Try and hide our yeah, because you don't know who that is. I mean, that could no, be dude. that could be Taliban for all you know. Dude, it was like a little Toyota truck or something, like a not even. It was like one of their local trucks, like a Daihatsu or something like that. Right, right. And this, it's just bouncing, driving, and uh, the guy he drives by us and then he stops, probably fifty meters past us, and uh, it's just quiet for a minute. And then the guy gets out and he's like, hey, he starts yelling. <laughs> Jesus. And we're like, dude, is that an American? And I, I mean, and like, does that, that sounds like an American dude, right? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> man. I was like, all right, well, who's going to go up to him? You know, one of us is going to stay yeah. back and be ready to roll on this dude, you know? So I was like, I'll go up. I was like, you just make sure you got this dude in your sights, you know? And so we go up and the guy's like, Hey, there you are. Where you know where you been? I'm like, dude, where have you where been? Have you you been? know, he's like, grab your stuff, throw it in a truck. And so we do. We throw it in a truck. We turn around, drive back, and link up with the team. And that was that was my initial infill into Afghanistan. It was nuts. Just that is two crazy. Young Air Force kids, man, who had no clue what we were doing, <laughs> and it just somehow it turned out like it happened. I, it's just amazing how that That's, happened. Yeah. That is such was, a different world than I'm used to. That's such a oh, different, different thing than, yeah. Oh man. So what, that was, I, mean, what, I can't even imagine what was going through your mind. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. It, it was, it was crazy. <clears throat> so then, uh, you remember the incident with, uh, with, um, the GPS. Right? Yeah. So after that happened, you, uh, I think it was Yoshida was mm -hmm. the combat controller. And then of course the TACP dude that was there, a couple of TACP dudes were there. All Yosha's team had to, they all got exfil. Right. So we ended up taking over that mission. Oh, okay. So they moved us over our team over with them. Well, that was the, Yosha was with Karzai. Okay. So now we're the team that's with Karzai. Wow. And we show up after, after the incident and where they were when the incident happened is there's this, uh, big dry riverbed, um, with a bridge. And then there's these two high peak mountains on the other side that the, after the bridge, this little valley is where you drove through. Yeah. Um, 
So when we show up, that was still, there was still a fight there. So Tracy and I were, got into that fight. Um, and like we would, like elements of the team would move up to the bridge area and we would try and fight. We were just, man, we were, we were laying waste to the, the mountainside because the guys were hiding in the mountains. Sure. Uh, they would try and get down into that dry riverbed because there's big, tall reeds and stuff down in there. And so, um, so that we did that for like, I think it took us like two days to clear that. And it was amazing that, uh, when it was over, when they, they surrendered. So they ended up surrendering. They kind of came back over the bridge to our side, surrendered to Karzai pretty much. Then when they turned around and gave them their weapons back, now they're on our side. And I'm like, Whoa. Oh my God. <laughs> oh you know? my God. I mean, we had a, not, not a guy on my team. One of the, one of the guys that was part of uh, cars, a personal security detail came up and was fighting with us on the, on the, on the North side of the bridge. He ended up getting shot. Um, and he, you know, he probably really didn't even have to be up there with him, but he ended up getting shot in like the, the shoulder. Um, it had to be Exo. But the point is, is dude, one of those dudes probably shot that guy, you know, and now he's on our side. Yeah. It was amazing. Bananas. Uh, <clears throat> hey, what were you using so, on the, on the mountainside? Like what kind of assets were you guys getting at that time? So for me, for where we were at, so the mission for us was to go in and, and help be one of the teams to take over Kandahar. Okay. So, um, and we were after Mula Omar, right? So okay. we're, or chasing little Omar, but Kandahar was where he was supposed to be. And that was still like the last city that had to be taken in Afghanistan. Okay. So we were moving South. <clears throat> and so what we were doing, um, is kind of clearing the way for Karzai. So we would, we would push forward, then Karzai would come up and, and link up with us and we'd push forward Karzai. Okay. Um, but we were, we were getting pretty close at that point. What was the question? Oh, uh, what was what so the asset series? Yeah. Oh, okay. so I had, F so I had where we were, that goes back to, so where we were like that far down South, yeah. we didn't have a lot of assets available to us. I had yeah, AC-130 available and then anything that pretty much came off a of carrier. So I had F-18s oh, okay. and F-14s. We still had FAC, a the F-14 was still there to do FAC A roll. Oh, okay. Amazing. Freaking dude, that. I seemed to always, it seemed like I always got the same fac A dude. Nice. And that dude was amazing. Like he made, he made the job easy for us. Nice. You know, cause our maps, we were using the Russian maps and they right. were like up to 600 meters off. Right. I remember that. Yeah. And so I'd be talking to the guy and he'd be like, dude, that's not it. And I'm like, what do you mean? And so once we, <laughs> once I finally registered to me, and we started using our e-trexes for targeting yeah yeah and using him man I, you know if it wasn't for him dude i would have been screwed it would have taken me a lot longer but he for was sure able yeah to get me on that right sheet of music quick <clears throat> yeah and uh so i'm totally blessed that we had those dudes those dudes are so squared away nice. uh, f-18 dudes are spot on and and uh and then of course we'd have uh the b1s and the AC-130. That was our yeah. assets, but I wasn't getting any of the, you know, the A-10s or any of that stuff, man. We were too yeah. far away. Um, sure, sure. So, no, yeah. And we weren't, we didn't have coverage all the time. We had quite a bit, um, but for us to do a, a request was not good because it took so long for us. If we sent up a request, it would take forever for us to get it. So once we got oh, okay. aircraft on station, we would pass aircraft. So it was like uh, my team. Then we had, uh, there were two other teams that were kind of enclosing in on, on Kandahar. One okay. was the, one was Cubic. Do you remember Andy Cubic? Yeah. Yeah. So his TAC P ended up going combat controller. Well, he was on another team. His team ended up doing the takeover of the, the airport, which was, oh, okay. that, that was amazing. That dude okay. did great, some great things. Um, yeah. But what we would do is we would pass aircraft between each other. Like, hey, dude, hold on. 
Hey, do you, how many bombs do you have left on your airplane? And he'd be like, yeah, I got like two, you know, two J dams. Like, Oh dude, save one for me and send them over when you're done. Cause that's how we had to do it, man. There was like, it was, it was, it was like the wild west. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say it was so, it, 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 we, we reacted so quickly that we really weren't as prepared as we could have been, I guess, maybe if we had more time to plan, but yeah, with the Russian maps and like just uh, just everything was, uh, and to the testament for, to guys like you, I mean, you guys in the north were just phenomenal. I mean, you guys crushed it, uh, just sheer, uh, just based off your sheer ability to adapt to a new environment. You know, I mean, you guys were mm-hmm. so flexible and so you know just so squared away that man, if it wasn't for you guys like you, we probably wouldn't. We probably would have had a hard time in the north for sure if it wouldn't hadn't been for guys like you. Yeah. So. Um, and that's how, that's how, you know, and it was very, I think it was very professional how we were doing it. For sure. I knew, I knew Andy from, you know, we were at Bragg together. Yeah. Uh, and we were essentially roommates for a while. So him and I were very connected. Now I didn't, I hadn't, I didn't see him. I never saw him yet. Um, but I, I knew who it was when he was on the mic. And so that comfort that I needed and probably he needed of that, Hey dude, I got your back, you got my back. And then you sure. know, we, AC-130 would show up. He would be in a good fight. I'd be like, dude, you need to contact Texas 17 over here or whatever, you know? And yeah, yeah. so that was just, uh, it, it all worked out really well. Sure, but sure. It, it was a new environment for me and for Tracy. And Tracy, had, Tracy was a brand new JTAC as a combat controller. So okay. when we initially first started talking, he's like, dude, I'll do all the HLZ, DZ stuff. You be the primary on the cast and i was like cool well that that shit got thrown out the window (laughs) two days into it you know and he became he did he did great he didn't you know he was he was just he was a little i think apprehensive because it wasn't his main job and he got thrown into it but he ended up doing great and so it, it was a benefit to the team that we were able to end up doing split team ops too nice so um that was another pretty cool capability of having him and I on the team, you know? Yeah, for sure. And so I don't know, there's, you know, there's always that little animosity between combat control and TAC-V, but dude, at that point, I loved him to death, man. And that made no difference, you know, what color beret he wore. Cause he, he, and Andy was out doing his thing. Cubic was doing his thing, doing great, man. I mean, yeah, yeah. It is a phenomenal story. I mean, I think it's, there's a book out about it, I think, but, oh, okay. uh, but his story is great. So we ended up moving down into Kandahar, taking Kandahar. And then, uh, so this is where, um, the incident happened. I call it the incident for me as, uh, we had just taken over Kandahar and we were staying in Mula Omar's compound. We had missed Mula Omar. He'd gotten away. But yeah. we in, we did end up taking over Kandahar, and uh, so it was the team I was with, and it wasn't just the team, but we were moving with Car's Eyes men. Andy was moving with Shar's Eyes men, um, and those two did Car's Eyes and Shar's Eyes didn't really get along that great. So there was okay. a lot of like, hey, those are bad guys over there. When it was really us, and same same, you know, they would try and be like, oh, those are bad guys over there, but it was like Andy and them. You know, so we had to be real careful with that stuff too. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, but, uh, so Andy swept around, they took the airport and it was the team I was with and another team ended up going through and, and clearing out Kandahar proper itself. And then we ended up, my team, we ended up going back to Mula Omar's and setting up base camp there. Okay. Uh, and if you've ever been to Kandahar area, it was called Gecko is I yep. think the original name of that place. And so that's yeah, yeah. where we set up. Okay. And so we started, you know, uh, that's, so we had our, our host nation forces with us there. Again, you, you're, the trust level was very low because we, oh, yeah. we are, we found that every time we started getting into a fight, we were the ones that ended up in front and they ended up in the back and that, that was supposed to be the other way around. Sure. They're supposed to be doing the main fight. And we were supposed to be in the back pushing them. And, uh, and the, it always ended up that we would be in the front uh, doing the fight and then they would be pulling up the rear. So mm. the trust level wasn't there. So we still pulled, you know, it was just us. So we could, we 
we found that we could not stay in the main compound. It was just too big. Yeah. So we ended up moving up to the, to the, one of the corners where it had this like big 35 foot tower or something. And, and so we would, we would still do our own security. Two guys would go up and pull pretty much security 24 seven, but you'd always have two guys up. Uh, so we had just gotten done taking over Kandahar. I think the Marines were coming in to officially secure the airport. Um, right. But uh, <laughs> Cubic and them had already been there. Yeah, they, yeah. I remember the Marines ended up getting lost. So we had to push out a contingent to go grab them and convoy them into the, the air, airport where Cubic was. Okay. Um, and then again, I think they made them take down the flag and then the Marines hoisted the flag saying Marines take Kandahar. <laughs> but I think in the newsreel, if you look on the back, Texas one seven was up on the, the, um, the control tower. Okay. All sign Texas one sevens up in the back spray painted <laughs> on it. So everybody knows nice. who's the real deal on that. Um, but again, that was Andy and his team. So I think it was that night we're bringing in some British, uh, special unit teams, right? Uh, so we had 53s coming in. And we were setting up, we had set up the LZ or the, yeah, the, the, yeah, the landing zone right outside Omar's compound, big open space. And there's still like sporadic AAA and stuff going off, you know, nothing coordinated, of course, you know, but you know, there are still dudes up in the mountains hiding and just trying to shoot right. some stuff off. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I think the air crews were still a little nervous, rightly so, I, I believe. Sure. So. We were bringing in these uh, British dudes, and it was me and Tracy uh, and about four or five guys from the from the ODA were out at there, and they were bringing in the helicopters. And Tracy was controlling. And the, dude, these, the 53s kept trying to force it in, right? And they would white out, dust out, and white out, and so they would take back off. And uh, Tracy was kept trying to give them direction, like, hey, you have to come in from this direction. Well... I remember, I think the one helicopter finally got on the ground. We unloaded it. Uh, this one of the British dudes came over and he was standing next to me by the truck. And the other helicopter was coming back in uh, to land after the first helicopter took off because they figured, okay, both of them trying to land just wasn't working. We land them one at a time, we'll be able to, to do it. So I remember all of a sudden starting to get pelted by rocks real bad. Yeah. And Tracy was like on my right. And I look over at Tracy, I look over to Tracy. I'm like, abort them MFers, you know, abort them, abort them. And I look over and he's gone. Oh no. Um, and I'm like, where the hell is he? Uh, and then all of a sudden, boom, I hear this, you know, big thud. The helicopter comes down and hits the truck. And instead of moving away from the truck, it moved, to our side and and we're all oh, like man. moving away and crouching down and then next thing you, you just feel the, the weight bouncing you off the ground right uh i i don't do the splits but i did that night because i was crouching <laughs> my legs went straight out um oh my god face i had my mvgs on face gets crunched into the ground um my i think my weapon stopped like just dug into my shoulder. Wait, so the, the helicopter landed on your truck or landed on you or both? It, or? It, it, on bo- it hit the truck. And then once it f- helped it hit the truck, it moved over. Oh my God. Uh, and so it ended up getting a few of us underneath it. So I think after this, the second time I got, I, I got pushed down on, I rolled back. And by this time they picked up and they grabbed the, I think they grabbed the truck with one of their wheels or something and moved the truck to you. So oh the truck was like God. 15 feet away from us. But as I rolled back, I rolled into this guy on the ground and I'm like, man, uh, I thought it was Tracy. Cause I thought I rolled to my right and there was only one guy on my right and it was Tracy. Right. And I roll it. And so I'm like, trait, I'm like trying to, to get his attention. Cause he's like sub he is in and out of consciousness kind of. Yes. And all of a sudden this, this other guy comes like crawling up to me and he shines a light on the, the dude who's out um, and Tracy's a black guy. So when I uh-huh. saw the light, the dude that was on the ground was a white dude. So 
immediately it's not tracy and i'm like who yeah, the heck yeah. is this guy and i didn't know him i did the face didn't i didn't recognize the face right it was the british dude that had just landed and uh and so i look at tracy i'm like what the hell and he's like dude so what had happened was the hell as the helicopter was coming down that the the backwash was so violent that it took tracy's rucksack because he had it sitting next to him and it pushed it away so he ran to grab the mic to abort him because you know his he was like he was like on his hands and knees trying to find his room oh my the radio God. in it thank god because he yeah, yeah. Been, he probably could have gotten injured if he wasn't sure he was, sure um so we start assessing this guy and he's he's jacked up right so i get up i run over I run over to the truck and we had a litter on the truck. I cut the litter off. We come back and we start getting this guy on the litter. And now the 53 is like landed over, you know, on the other side of the truck and the load master comes out and I'm just like, dude, what the hell? And he's like, we got to go. And so we get this dude on, we get this British guy onto the, the litter and get him onto the back of the 53. And I remember us carrying him on and I just saw this air force. I don't know. I want to say he was a master. I don't know, but I just remember looking at him and I grabbed him like, what the hell? And I'm just like yelling at him. Like, what is yeah. your problem? Um, and then one of the team guys grabs me and starts pulling me off the back of the 53. He's like, we got to get out of here. They got to get out of here. And so I step off the 53 and I just collapse. And I'm like, man, something's wrong with my leg. Oh no. So I, I look up at, at the, the medic on the team. I'm like, Jay, my freaking legs hurting. So they like pull me aside and they just cut my pant leg right then. Right. Yeah. Cause I felt something, but with all that adrenaline, I didn't notice anything. So sure. they cut my pant leg open and they're trying to look at my leg and they're like, dude, we can't, it's already swelling, but we can't tell if it's broke or not. Yeah. Uh, they're like, do you want to get evac? And I was like, no, I was like, no. I was like, dude, if I get back on that helicopter, They'll probably throw me out the back of some of the words I just said to them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, so they're like, well, we'll assess it. And if it's broke, if we can, we'll check it out. And if it's broke, then we're going to have to evac you. Yeah. So next thing I know, they give me a shot. Uh, I go to La La Land for a while. Right. Um, and I, I wake up the next morning and I walk, uh, hobble out of the, the little place I was staying. I see our truck. <laughs> And it's just like crunched <laughs> oh. <laughs> and they have like this big old helicopter on the hood of the truck with a circle and a cross over it. And, <laughs> uh, so it's like, well, yeah, there's one, one's down. <laughs> um, so I was, I was in some pain. Uh, and I, I don't know if I should have got evac or not, but I didn't. And yeah. the, what was kind of cool is remember that tower I told you that we were, we would go up and pull guard duty. That yeah, was yeah. my rehab. Oh, okay. I had, I had a torn ACL is what I had. I had a okay. torn ACL, two, two pull groins, uh, sprained, uh, ankle. My back was like black and blue. Um, Jeez. uh, cuts on my face from the MVGs. Uh, but, uh, I was healthy enough to stay and they, and I'd climb this ladder up the tower every day, twi at least twice a day. And that was my rehab. And, nice. and they were, you know, I was a little skeptical of helicopters coming in after that, you know, no but doubt. They, um, you know, they made me get back out there. And the day we, we, we put, uh, cars, I on the helicopter to go up to become president, you know, I, I was out there and then we had a couple, uh, resupplies come in and they made me go out there and, and run, they didn't make me there. Like you're going out to, you know, we need you to go do the LCs. And I was sure. like, man. And of course, you know, I was finding like the lowest point trying to find a ditch. <laughs> right. you know? These guys are coming in and be like, it's GG laying on me again. Oh but, my uh, God. I mean, then, dude, it's, it could have been a lot worse for sure. I mean, obviously, but man, that's, that's horrible. Cause you, yeah. cause at that, at that point, I mean, it's brown out, it's night, you got nods uh -huh. on. I mean, it's it, just chaos. I'm sure. I mean, you had no idea what was going on. Yeah. Jeez, um, man. And there's not like a lot of people around, you know? Right. You don't have a hospital. There's no hospital exactly. there. There's not, um, so, so I ended up, we ended up staying there and that was early still, you know, we're talking like yeah. December's 
fifth or sixth, I want to say, this happened. So, yeah. Um, very early. Very early. Yeah. Like you said, there was nothing there. Not No real infrastructure, no real support system. I mean, it was, yeah, you guys were kind of on your own yeah. for most for the most part. Yeah. No, it was, it was nuts. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was the deal, man. So I just started rehabbing. I had, dude, the, the, the team I was with was just amazing. You know, great. Yeah. It was, it was kind of crazy because during, I think before 9-11, you had all, all these ODAs, but they weren't full ODAs, you know, mm-hmm. just, they just didn't have the guys to make full ODA. So this was, this ODA was actually a, um, uh, uh, they were a dive team. Okay. And so they pull the, the team sergeant. So the guy who's been on the team for a long time, he ended up being like, uh, he, sh- I, I don't want to say he should have been the team sergeant. He was probably the team sergeant before they brought this other guy in okay. who had just gotten there. He became the, the team sergeant, but Jano was that really had the team, you know, he was, yeah, he yeah. was the guy who'd been there, but the Delta on the team, they had, so the team was supposed to have pretty much two of everybody, right? So two Deltas, two Echoes. Well, that's not the way it was being run before. They just didn't have the numbers. But when sure. they went into Afghanistan, they made sure that every team had the full conglomerate, two Deltas, okay. two Echoes, two Bravos, two Charlies. So you had some of these guys that were kind of new to the team because they were, you know, they were just pulling these guys to make full teams. Oh, okay. And so we had, we had a young Delta and he ended up being, uh, he, he's a great friend and I probably owe him my life cause he took great care of me during that time. And he's the nice. one that, that got me back to hell, you know, and was just adamant about make, taking care of me throughout that whole thing. Uh, Jay Rico, man, cool dude, man, just yeah. cool. And he was young, man, oh, uh, yeah. but he was, he was squared away. Um, so I owe him a lot. I owe that whole team a lot. They were just a bunch of great guys. Um, and they took me in and I ended up, and they took Tracy in too. And they, you know, by the end of it, you wouldn't have been able, I don't think you could tell who was and who wasn't, uh, Air Force or Army guy. You know, yeah, that's, yeah. you just become that tight. And, um, the level of respect I had for all those guys, uh, was just great. I'm nice. forever in debt to those dudes because they taught me a lot and were always there for me. But anyway, so we, you know, I think it was, anaconda kicked off right so we're still down where we were and they i think they ended up pulling us for qrf once that whole thing got kicked off i think another team came down there was there was a multiple teams down that area so i did get a i got i got a back up here okay once Kanahar and everything did get everything after the the helicopter and say all that stuff i you know i was able to link up with cubic and at oh um, nice downtown where so the odb the b team like the guys who ran all the odas Mm -hmm. um the b team was held up at like the palace in in kandahar the the big government building in kandahar it was like a palace you know yeah Um, that's where the b team so that's where we would go and get our stuff and then go back out to our locations well that's where i I did get to link up with cubic Nice. Uh, there and man that was like a reunion i got i should <laughs> i owed I, I told you i was gonna get you pictures but i will get you yeah, pictures yeah. um there's a picture of him and i together and that that meant the world to me man uh i bet that felt good yes and just to see him and we were still alive after all that man it right it's like nuts <laughs> and crazy and just knowing where we came from you know remember we were yeah. talking about the brag early days and to yeah, yeah. see this now it was it was great uh so I did get a link up with him then. And, uh, and then I think, I think, uh, Max Porras came in with an ODA and he went down, he was, he stayed down downtown. Um, but anyway, we got pulled for, I think QRF for the Anaconda thing. So okay. essentially, um, but then when we got pulled, we went back to Uzbek and I didn't go back in. Uh, they, I, I was able to go home after that. Oh, really? March, <clears throat> April. March or April, I think. Tracy, I think. Yeah, but you've been there for a while already, though, right? I mean. Yeah, and and Tracy stayed with the team, so we were supposed to be QRF for uh, the whole Anaconda thing, but I think everybody was, and so I think right, we were right. pretty, kind of low on the pecking order going in. So another an aircraft had crashed, and some MC one thirty had crashed, 
and uh, they needed somebody to go out and, and watch it and pull guard duty out. So I think there was a, some Rangers and the team I was on ended up going back out to the, where this crash site was. And, but I didn't go. I don't, I don't know. I think I was, they were like, nah, we just need one dude. And Trace is like, I'll go. And I was like, it was supposed to be like two or three days. And I don't know if I was being held back for, you know, possibly going on another QRF or whatever, but it never, nothing ever developed. They went out there and did that. And that was the last time I saw those guys. Wow. You know, because by the time they got back, I was on my way home. It, but that's how, that's kind of how it works sometimes. You know, you're like, you, you just never know where you're going to be. I mean, the war is so, so crazy that, you know, you, you, you spend all this time with this team and you're like, oh, I'll see you guys when you get back. And the next thing you know, you're like, you never see him again. You know, it's like, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, so I, you know, I look scraggly, man. I lost like 35, 40 pounds almost. Wow. My, I had a beard, but it wasn't, didn't look good like yours, man. I was like, <laughs> and I, you know, it hadn't been washed or, you know, and I, my yeah. hair was long. I had this nasty beard and I lost so much weight and it wasn't like losing good weight. It was like, sure, sure. you know, and so I'll, I'll tell this quick story. <laughs> this is hilarious. So I'm coming back with, uh, Ray Garotti and Billy Burgum and we make it back to Dover. Then we get in a vehicle and we drive from Dover down to Baltimore International to fly back to Carson or to Colorado Springs. <laughs> and, and we don't know, we've been gone, you know, so we don't know how things have really changed with all the airport security and all that. Oh, kind of right, stuff. So, right. So we show up and we're at the t- check in counter, the ticketing counter, and, uh, I throw the weapons up there. I was like, so I'm the dude, I'm going to take care of the weapons. Right. So I yeah. have all of our weapons in a couple of cases and I throw them. I was like, Hey, I have to escort these on the plane and the girl lady at the ticketing. And she's like, Oh, we don't do it that way anymore. You know? And so she was confused. I was confused. And she was just like, she's like, you can just take them with you to the front of the, to the plane and they'll put them on the plane for you. I'm like, really? <laughs> she's like, yeah. I'm like, all right. Well, Billy and them like, had already left because, you know, I was doing all the paperwork for the the weapons and they already went through. (laughs) So here I am walking with these freaking, you know, weapons cases to security (laughs) and I throw them on the conveyor belt and they go right on through. (laughs) And all of a sudden the big light turns on this big red light is like, right. And dude, national guard dudes are running over. Cops are running over. Oh my God. And I'm standing there. I'm like, what's going on? You know? And the lady's like, these, you have what? I was like, yeah, the lady at the ticketing agency told me to bring them. To me. <laughs> and so I'm trying to show her my ID and show her I'm in the military and trying to explain to her where I came from. Well, I had lost so much weight. I had my beard that was not good. My long hair. She's like, that's not you. Oh man. So now I don't even look like the person that I am on my ID cards. I'm showing her right, everything right. I have. Next thing you know, I'm like down in the basement in this FBI office, you know, and they're like, <laughs> no way. Yes. <laughs> and, and my plane, I'm trying to get back home to see my wife and kids, you know, and yeah, so yeah. my plane's like out there trying to, and I'm like, and I'm talking to these guys. And so they finally get something that says, I am who I am. They look at whatever. And they're like, okay. <laughs> And I give them the whole story that, you know, we're just coming back home. And now that everything, they're like, what? You're, you're trying to get home? And dude, they're like, hold on. So they they call somebody. They get me in a car, drive me over to uh, the airplane. They open up the door. They get me on the airplane. They get our weapons put in down below. And I walk in and, I, and Billy and Ray are sitting in like first class, <laughs> sipping on a drink. Yeah. And they're like, hey, man, where you been? I'm like, dude, really? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so oh, my get, God. I made it. I made the plane. Uh, I get home. And, of course, my wife, like, we're, like, walking down uh, the airport. And my wife, like, walks right by me. She doesn't even notice me. <laughs> and then, of course, you go pick up my kids. My kids won't even come to me because I look so horrible. So, Oh, yeah. 
so I was never big on coming home with the big beard. You know, remember how that was kind of like the cool, I was like, nah, that's not for me. Cause it, it didn't turn out. You want, you well. want your family to recognize you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't want to get held up at the freaking airport. <laughs> yeah. No you know, kidding. For being a, like, like a terrorist. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, that's I, awesome. So we get home, uh, we put all our stuff, you know, away, you know, and, uh, and, you know, I'm happy to see the wife and the kids. Everybody's starting to warm back up. And I don't know what it was, man. I told Jenny, I was like, well, we're either going to have another kid or have a dog, get a dog. <laughs> and I honestly, it's probably three weeks later. She's like, we ain't getting a dog. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so my wife got pregnant with my youngest, Jamin. And because of that, I knew there was going to be this rotational thing going on now. Right. Cause nobody oh, knew yeah. when this thing was going to end. So I volunteered to go back so I could be home for Jamin being born. Nice. Um, so I wasn't home that long, a few months. Yeah. Maybe three, three and a half, four months, three months. Now I went you back guys, home. I, I've talked about this a lot on this show. Um, the S USF guys were gone a lot for like, and it wasn't, you, there were so few of you and so many ODAs, and you had so much little dwell time. I mean, it was – man, it had to be exhausting, the, the oh. tempo you guys had. Yeah, and, and see, at this time, I was still ignorant enough to, to volunteer to go back over because it was <laughs> selfish. I wanted to be home for my son to be born, you know? Sure, sure. So I ended up going back over. Like, So it's 2002, and I'm on my second tour already. Right. <laughs> uh, I, I end up because I get into theater, I get in there and they're like, well, I was like, I know Kandahar. And they're like, all right. So they sent me right back to where I was the first time. Perfect. Different, different team. You know, I think this was a seventh group team that I was with that time. And so I link up with them. Same place, dude, the, the guys that we were fighting, the guys, uh, the Northern Alliance guys we were fighting with were still, you know, some of them were still there. One was our electrician now. Another dude was a cook, uh, you know, nice. and so I show up, it was like a family reunion. They're all like <laughs> hugging on me and happy. And, and the team's like, what's going on? I was like, I know these guys, you know, we go way back, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from the beginning, <laughs> from the beginning. So it was kind of cool that I had already, you know, that the team was like, oh, this dude already has some, some, you know, relationships established. Yeah. So you got like instant cred with the team at that time. Yeah. So instant yeah. cred with the team. And, and so that was kind of cool. Cause I knew the area very well, you know, so when yeah. we were just talking about doing things, I knew everything. And so that was, that was really cool. So that was, that was a, a pretty good rotation uh, with those guys. And then I get home uh, the end of 2002, beginning of 2003 and guess what's coming up, bro. Yeah. OIF. And uh and sure enough, man, they're like, dude, get ready, we're going. And I and I I freaking was like, I'm not going. <laughs> and, I, uh, and they're like, like you don't I just have got a back from there. I tell you. They're like, you don't have a or choice. I was like, everybody's got a choice in life, you know? Yeah. And and I and I'm not going. I was like, I, I'm I volunteered to go back so that I can be here to see my son being born, you know? Right. That's all I wanted. That's the whole reason. Uh, they're like, oh, don't matter. Yeah, you, you got to go. And I'm like, nope, I'm not doing it. And they're like, they they couldn't fathom that I was telling them no. Right, right. And I was like, well, I don't know what you got to do. Yeah, I, I don't know. Do I go to jail? I don't know what, what <laughs> yeah, happens like, to what, me. What's the next step here? Because it's not happening. So yeah, yeah. get it figured um, out. So had a had a decent, you know, the there's the commander at the time. I can't remember who he was. He took a step back and he's like, all right, here's the deal. He's like, we can find somebody for you. And I was like, perfect. All I wanted to do is be there for my son being born. Yeah. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. That, that only happens once in a lifetime. You know, th it's totally justifiable. I, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. And so they found somebody, it wasn't hard dude to find somebody to go. Right. You know what I mean? Everybody wanted a piece right there, sure. you know? Um, so they they did they found but the difference with this is there's a the big army was already involved in it too so there are a lot of body you know like everybody was already playing a part as to sure. where afghanistan was very soft focused in the beginning right. so there was everybody wanted to do that but now the big army had to take in the plan having their jtac so you couldn't just like pull from anywhere 
Right, right. But they they did find a replacement for me. Uh, and they, I remember them telling me, they're like, dude, you probably won't even have to go at all. And I was like, <laughs> oh, cool. You know, I'm down with that. Yeah, whatever. So sure enough, man, uh, Jamin was born. And two weeks later, <laughs> I'm gone. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> Dude, it's just like, it was was crazy, man. Yeah. So, um, but they, they held to their promise and I held to mine, you know, I said, I told them all I want to do is be there to see my son being born. And I was, and they tried, but Hey, the numbers were needed. And so I ended up going. Uh, so then we went into Iraq and then that was pretty much where I, all my deployments after that, I think I had one more deployment to Afghanistan. Um, and that one wasn't very dynamic, but most of my deployments in Iraq were, were pretty dynamic because that's when I started working with um, SIF and, okay. and and those type of guys. And so the, the, the dynamics, well, the mission was different now too than sure. Afghanistan, but there was a lot. It was a lot more dynamic, um, you know, focused uh, ops. And, and yeah. I don't want to say every deployment was like that. There were some deployments that were just a little, you know, you went and you were doing fit type stuff, you know, helping right. making sure that that towns had schools created and, uh, you know, but the second you got onto a SIF team or, you know, another agency team, you, you were busy. And, yeah. and I think that, that, that happened, uh, I probably, it was probably my last or second to last rotation over there to where I can't remember the kid's name. He was with the Rangers, but he had gotten shot in the arm. And I was with a SIF team. We were on the same, we were in the same, uh, in the same compound. And I remember he got hurt. And so they extracted him and they didn't have another JTAC to fill. So now I'm doing, I'm running with the Rangers and the SIF. And man, I, 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 I remember calling back saying, I can't do this anymore. Dude, I was freaking <laughs> ragged. Yeah, ragged. yeah. Um, cause it was oh, exhausting. We were, in, yeah. we were in to crit dude. And we, we Oh were, yeah. We were rocking, bro. We were not, we were not playing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell me like, a little bit about that. Like, so tell me, cause I'm not, I, uh, I didn't have a, hardly any, I had no experience with the SIF. So yeah. Tell me about some of those, um, some of those ops you guys went on and had, kind of had what you guys are up to. Yeah. So it was, you know, um, so that was the first time. So, you know, when, the, the, the regular, when you're out doing the regular soft thing and the, the, you're, you're doing all your own products, you're, yeah. you're building it, you're building the plan, which was great. I mean, that's a great skill to have. Um, and you seem like you're like a lot more involved in it. Um, right. But when you start getting into these, you know, the, the SIF or um, the special agency units or, you know, special, you know, the green team or whatever, Dude, everybody does that stuff for you. All right. And so that was an eye opener for me. Yeah. Um, and so we're on this, you know, you know, I'll talk about the last one, little compound. Um, we shared it with the Rangers and you had, a, we had a pager and we, we couldn't go anywhere, but we still had a pager. <laughs> right. Because everything was a TST, you know. And yeah, on yeah. a moment's notice, man. So you slept during a day, you got up and uh, started. And we didn't even get to really go to the chow hall and stuff. They would bring the mermites in for us. And we had our own little chow hall in the compound. And they'd bring the food into us and we would eat. And next thing you get a, you know, your pager would go off. And next thing you go to the, the team room, you get the brief. Freaking the fires guys. Now they had fires guys, right? Now now they're dedicated to fires guys for everybody, which is kind of yeah, cool because yeah. now yeah. I wasn't responsible for all that anymore. <laughs> right. But they would bring you all your products, man. They would ask, you know, what size do you want your products, you know? And they would like make it like, <laughs> you know, I don't know if you were one of those dudes that had the little football thing on, you know, you can slide. I tried it ball. for a little bit. Yeah, I, I yeah. couldn't figure it out. I, it just didn't work out for me. But yeah, <laughs> some guys did for sure. But yeah. they would ask you like, hey, how do you want your products? You know, they can make them that size. They can do whatever yeah. they wanted, man. And I was like, wow. And you get ready for an op and the dude in the fire shop, he'd be like, hey, dude, go get your shit together. I'll I'll handle the stack for you while, while you're getting ready. So, nice. and the stack wasn't, you know, 
back on these other SOF, SF missions, dude, you didn't have a stack. You were lucky to have right. some airplanes, right? right? Now you're having, dude, I'm almost every op I had, Little Birds, AC-130, manned, ass, manned ISR assets, unmanned ISR assets, freaking fast movers, dude, daps, you name it, dude. They were like, everybody was there all right, the time. Right. And so that's where you, you know, so I would, you know, get into the platform, whatever it was, was whether it was a helicopter or a striker or whatever, man. And he'd hand the stack over to me and I'd have all these dudes up. And <laughs> I remember what was kind of cool. And I don't think I'm the guy who, who figured this out, but I think another, a couple other people might've done this too. But when we were, you know, that time in Iraq, freaking, uh, the IEDs were huge, right? Yeah. But we were still rolling. That didn't keep us from going. And we didn't right. we didn't wait for anybody to go clear a route for us or anything. If it was a TST, you were gone. Right. And if you couldn't get there by helicopter, we were getting in freaking these strikers. And so we all had the jammers, right? And we'd run with jammers on. Well, bad thing for a JTAC, because when your jammer's on, comms are crap, right? Right, right. But what we had figured out was is if I could get a little bird to fly like right overhead, I had just enough RF energy to burn through to that guy and he could relay everything for me. Oh, so okay. that kind of became like a, a little impromptu TTP that we have, dude. And not everybody had that capability because you didn't, not everybody had little birds like every op they went out on, but we did. Huh. So we developed this thing to where now we can run with our jammers on and because there are times where people would turn their jammers off just so that they can make comms. Uh, but then you're vulnerable yeah. to yeah, a, and then you're a vulnerable. command that needed IED or some sort of, you know. Yeah. yeah, and the team didn't want to do it, you know. Right. Like, dude, you can talk to them when we get there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but we had figured this out that by just that one dude staying low enough and right in the right spot that I could talk through him. And then we had comms. So that was really nice. cool. Just like little things like that that you adapt and you, sure. you do. And, you know, again, this kind of goes back way back to my starting days at Bragg and, and, and given the dudes who trained me and those guys that we were talking about earlier, all those guys are the guys that allowed me, you know, I remember I said, jazz never gave me oh, like yeah. limits. It was like being because of those dudes and their way of thinking allowed me to, um, you know, kind of like be able to like think out of the box a little bit like that. Sure, sure. Uh, Which is exactly what kind of stuff you need to be doing at an ODA or at in, in, in a special forces kind of world. I mean, they're very, very uh, asymmetrical, you know, in their, mm -hmm. in their processes. So yeah, that's awesome. And, and that's, you know, I, my little experience I had with the Rangers is they, those dudes were just hard charging, bro. Those guys yeah. ate, man. They like oh, to yeah. eat. And, uh, yeah. and I was, they wore me out, man. And I was like, <laughs> I can't, I can't do both of these things. Man. Was, <laughs> um, those dudes wore me out. So that yeah. was, um, so we essentially dried to crit up. That was 08, 09. I think that was like my last 09 was my last deployment, but we were on like rotation, you know, from, from not from 2001 to then it's kind of like you said you know that the soft guys there was only so many of us yeah but there was a lot of odas so the guys that were permanent soft still had to keep this like rotational thing up right right um and then we started bringing in augmentees for the soft things and and honestly uh i thought it was i you see some of the guys that were augmentees for the saw yeah became some of, of really badass soft tag p guys yeah, you know what i mean for sure uh-huh um and at the time you know i was i had the opportunity to see them as their first time to support an sf oda right you know but then they go back they go through selection and they go to they go to the soft tech P side and then they do go out and do great things, you know? Yeah. So that, that's, that was, I was cool. It was cool to have that opportunity to see these young guys. That one, you know, there's, there's so many of them Reynolds. I don't know if any, if you knew Burt Reynolds, 
Oh yeah, for sure. Brian Reynolds, but Bert. Yeah. Um, but these guys, man, just they're they're tons of those stories, you know. Yeah. Uh, um. But wouldn't you yeah. say that it's those kind of guys that are looking to volunteer for that kind of job, and then just you know they're it, it's it was great for to give them an opportunity because they're. They were probably going to do great things on the conventional side, but man, giving them that that little in to the ODA world or or Ranger world or whatever they whoever they augmented, <clears throat> just kind of catapulted them into that that higher level of operation. I mean, I think that's a good mm-hmm. op- those, those are good opportunities for those guys to kind of so so it sucked that there wasn't enough JTACs to go around each ODA, but it was nice to give these other guys opportunities to kind of cut their teeth and then say, oh yeah, this is what I want to do from now on and kind of move it to that that down that yeah. road. For, yeah. And, and honestly, in the beginning, we didn't set them up for success either. No. You know? Well, you weren't set up for success. I mean, no, let alone but, an augmentee. I mean, yeah. You, and, know? you know, you know, we were throwing them into the deep end. A lot of these young yeah. kids into the deep end, man. And yeah. to see what they would do and how they ended up performing and uh, was just amazing because, you know, I, I think we got to a point to where we couldn't do a lot of pre-mission or, you know, pre-deployment training. Sure. But one of the things we could do is we could take them to a couple courses right? and start running them through some stuff. Uh, then you kind of get to see what their metal is there and see how, you know. And so we, we started, that's when we figured like, hey, if this is going to be a continuous thing, we need to set something up for these guys. Not only to set them up for success, but to also set us up for success to show that we're just not throwing anybody into that augmentee role. Sure. Um, and so, and I think that worked out better, but it took us some time to get there, you know? So just to see these kids show up in the theater, I, one dude showed up and I think I was like the senior guy at the time. And when we get to you and it was like, uh, almost, almost all the dudes seemed to be augmentees. Um, and I'd say most of those guys ended up going to either Rangers or soft eventually, but this, on this rotation, I felt like I was like, the only one that was like a permanent soft tack P at the time. I, I may not be, I can't remember who all was there. Um, I just remember these young kids that stood out in my mind, like Ramirez yeah. and, and uh, so, but one kid shows up and he doesn't have any gear <laughs> and he has like one of, he has like a flak vest, you know, and, and then he doesn't have, and I'm like, dude, what are you, what are you doing here? Right. I was like, I'm like, I can't send you out with a team. I was like, you're going to have to stay here at, at the siege of soda. Cause I just yeah. can't until we get you your gear, until your unit sends you some gear. And cause even at that time, I think jazz did some stuff to fix that. Like yeah. he got some, he got equipment put into theater so that when dudes rolled in, he can give them stuff, you know, right. right. Again, that's jazz the, doing the right thing and making sure stuff, you know, and it almost seemed like those conventional units that were losing these guys were like, well, you're on your own. They'll give you yeah. whatever you need. It's like, well, wait a minute. You, you got to give them some kit to, you know, I mean, but they weren't. They were just like, all right, go ahead, go for it. They'll give you some stuff when you get there. It's like, no, they won't. Yeah. Not until was, Jazz figured it out. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I remember that being part of their tasking is that they were responsible for bringing their own gear, but the units were like, what? you know, we don't have all this. So, yeah. yeah. So this kid shows up and, and so, I was like, you're going to have to stay at Siege of Soda until we get your gear. Uh, and by the way, the guy, the ALO that was at Siege of Soda looked at me and he's like, ah, I'm out. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be going to another. He's like, nope. Cause he saw me and he's like, dude, you know what's going on and I'm, I got to go home. So he just left me. So now oh I was God. supposed to be going out to uh, a SIF team, but we had no ALO up at Siege of Soda. So now I'm stuck at Siege of Soda. And I kept this kid there with me. And he, I guarantee he hated me because he just yeah. thought I just totally ruined his whole life. In hindsight. Probably saved his life. Well, he saved my, that kid was the most amazing person to have. He, it's like God put him there for me. Oh, really? He was the best person that could have been sitting in that seat in Siege of Soda. So square. Also. Away. Just square. I mean, one, he had the work ethic because he could have been, he could have looked at me and was like, dude, you just screwed me to go into ODA. And, you know, he could have had no motivation. Right, right. But the dude work ethic was, 
beyond his, 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 he was super smart. Yeah. Um, uh, and he never, he, 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 there was nothing outside of the spectrum that he wasn't willing to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, he just stood up to, he, he didn't, dude, he didn't take it, give, he didn't take it to, uh, or, um, no. he rose to the occasion, I guess he, he, he was like, okay, I can't do what I want to do, but I'm, I'm going to crush this, whatever I'm doing. I'm going to crush this part. Yeah, so. and, that, and, yeah. and in hindsight, I'm like, dude, why weren't, why aren't you a so freaking soft now? I mean, this kid <laughs> had it, he had yeah, it. Yeah. Um, and I ended up respecting him immensely, dude, for this whole attitude towards the whole thing. And then the job that he did was phenomenal. And yeah, yeah. he ended up having a great, I mean, in Siege of Soda, man, they, they, all the, the officers, everybody loved him, man, because he was just a worker. I mean, yeah, just the, the perfect person to have there at that time. Yeah. Um, cause we had, you know, when you, and we were still the fires element, I think they were just starting to bring in army dudes into the fires role. Okay. So we were able to start handing it off a little bit more, but we were running the whole JTAC program for all soft JTACs, whether it was TACP, combat control, the SEALs, you know? Okay. So I was responsible for ensuring that all these dudes were current and qualified, number one, you know? <laughs> and that, that's a whole, that's a story, man. Right. Uh, some, some SEALs, man. It, <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. Dude, uh, <laughs> I got told by the commandant of the SEAL uh, JTAC course that he was going to have my head on a platter because <laughs> <laughs> I had deserted all the seals in theater and it wasn't on, I didn't want to, uh, but, um, so one day the kid and I were sitting there, I'll, I'll say his name cause he's a, I love this kid to death and he's had an opportunity to work for me uh, a couple of times now. Um, Justin Keo, man, that kid or that man now he's chief Keo yeah. now, uh, yeah. or he's soon to be chief Keo. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And he ended up getting out to a team on that rotation too, because oh, nice. he, not only did he deserve it, but he earned it. He yeah. earned it. And, but man, that guy was a kid, such a amazing man. Um, so one day we're sitting there and I was like, dude, we need to look at these, we need to look at everybody's pack, make sure everybody's good to go. Right. And we start going through them and just, uh, Justin's all saying, he's like, dude, he's like, man, Sean, this ain't right, man. We started looking through the seals ones and it was not good. I mean, some were like pieces of paper like this is written on like that. That was their, you know, <laughs> that was their eval. And I'm like, what the heck, man? And uh, so, and you start going through the reg and they're like, well, they're, they don't have to abide by the same standards as us or the combat controllers. They had different regs, you know? But right. Right. There still had to be certain elements within that, that evaluation, like a date or, right. you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> a signature. <laughs> you know? So I, I go to the L and O I'm like, Hey man, here's the deal. I think what it sparked, it was, I had, uh, one of the one of the SEAL teams out there, a kid called up and he wanted he wanted a twenty four seven cap put over his location. For they went to a dude's they they were going to a dude's house, but the guy wasn't there, and so they were just going to squat in the dude's house until he ended up showing up. Okay, nice. But they, they didn't know how long Good it was going to be. Yeah. Was it going to be twenty four hours? Was it going to be three days? Was it going to be? <laughs> but he wanted a twenty four seven cap set up around him, over him. And I'm like, dude, this is not, <laughs> I mean, so it's like, not enough guys, for that. Do these guys really know like how to, you know, how to utilize it? I knew they, sure. you know, it's not hard to control it. Right. 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 But to know how to use it and put it to, you know, uh, so, so we started looking and that's, so I went to the L and O and I'm like, Hey man, this is the evals. Can you square these away? Can you make them l legit? Like, yeah. I need some dates. I need signature, you know, and he's like, Oh yeah, man, no problem. Got it. You know, and he was a good dude. I you know, he hung out around us quite a bit, but he, he ended up leaving or doing something. And so weeks go by and nothing's happening. So I ended up, uh, saying, Hey, you guys cannot request air until I get this stuff squared away. Yeah. 
And boy, that sent, I mean, I got calls from ACC chiefs and commanders and like, what are you doing? Uh, I think Colonel Cleveland was the C. DeSoto commander at the time. And he came down and sat next to me. He's like, Sean, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, he's getting calls. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, sir, here's, here's the deal. These are your bond. You know, you own this. If this right. guy controls, you own that bond. That's your responsibility. I'm just trying to do the right thing and, and, and make sure these guys are, are doing, are going to be legit if there's a mistake. Right. Cause I don't want anybody to be blamed for it. And, uh, it was really, he was really cool. He like, I thought he was going to be like, Hey, just make it happen. But yeah. he, he was able, he looked at me and he's like, you're doing the right thing. He's like, get it squared away though. Nice. And I was like, perfect. And that's when I had, you know, and that's when this commandant calls me and is like, tells me he's going to have my head on a platter because I deserted <laughs> all the seals. And th- well, after all that, you told him to I do had, the right thing and he want, you want to do that. Yeah. And that's exactly <laughs> it. Is. And so I had to like send all these evals off to all these different organizations, you know, these different entities so that they could see what I was doing was not just because I felt like doing it, you know? Sure, right. So the next thing you know, they had to like pull all their SMEs together uh, in theater uh, in, you know, back in stateside and go through all the evals and get them squared away. Nice. And then they sent them back and turn them back on. And, and that, in that, that guy ended up calling me and apologizing again. But originally he did say he was going to have my head on a platter. And I was like, <laughs> all right, well, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> and Justin's like, just looking at me going, what are you doing? Man? <laughs> so, there were a lot of programs like that though. I mean, it, it, a lot of, um, a lot of the initial soft, you know, not Air Force, but like, and not the Marines either. The Marines are usually pretty squared away too. But yeah, the Army and the Navy, I think they were just, they in their defense, a, a, a Special Forces operator and a Navy SEAL have so many uh, tasks they have to, are responsible for. I mean, it's just amazing. It's even more than a CCT guy. It's even more, it's just crazy. Almost, it's comparable to a PJ. And uh, just to add JTAC on top of that, they're like, man, just, I don't know. It's it's very hard to do. It's very it's very difficult. So, but yeah. it's also a, a big responsibility, like you said, when that aircraft does show up on station and that he does drop some sort of ordinance. Like he's got to know what he's doing, otherwise he can just kill friendlies, which defeats the whole purpose of CAS in the first place. So yeah, yeah. I mean you did the right thing. You did the you totally did the right. Yeah, obviously. and that was that was a tough time, you know, for me and i in that you know, just trying to do that. But, and I understand yeah. you're right, man. That's not this guy's everyday job. And I understood that. And I didn't yeah, expect yeah. all their stuff yeah. to be perfect. And you're like, it's just has some inkling I, of yeah. you know, something, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's gotta be. So somebody doesn't fry, you know what I mean? Right. Right. It's gotta be legal to, to, to you know, just gotta make it. So it's all legit. Um, sure. Sure. Uh, so that, that I learned a lot during that time. And then I was like, finally another officer showed up and I was like, screw it. I'm out here. So Justin and I <laughs> did him out, man. I got, I got down to a SIF team where I felt my, that comfort. And I was like, ah, this is, this is me. This is where I belong. That, <laughs> it's crazy. That you're like, just give me to the front lines so I can relax, please. Yeah, you know, <laughs> exactly. It's like, uh, back in my element. Finally. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of stories for over there that, I mean, uh, you know, some, some close calls, uh, a lot of good feelings, some bad feelings, you know, uh, yeah. of things that happened over there. Um, but overall I'm, I'm happy with, with what I, I did over there. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. um, speaking of that, I know, um, and I want to transition because this is pretty, I think it's a good time to transition into, something that you were involved with, with guys like Rollison and Billy Otter. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the Save a Warrior program. Do you, oh, yeah. Feel comfortable it, talking about that? Oh, is that it? Sure. Yeah. Right. Represent, yeah. Yeah, I did want to get into that because uh, that's, it's, uh, that's changed my life, man. Yeah. It really has. And so there's, you know, you go back to, and there's so many so many of us, uh, you know, have had different experiences downrange. And if you talk to 99% of us, every, of 
the guys in our community are proud of what they did and happy of what they did and wouldn't change a thing. Right. And I'm that way too, but there's also, uh, there's also some stuff that comes with that because not everything that happens over there is great. And you see, and you're going to see stuff and you're going to do things and, uh, that stick with you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, and so there's good memories and there's bad memories, but the bad memories are, are what seems to be what people not, I don't want to say the person themselves focuses on, but it's there, you know, and to yeah. save a warrior, for me is, uh, it's got me. So there's, there's part of me is like, so on, on these deployments, the number of deployments, every time you, every time you come home, you have to reconnect with your family. Right. Right. And then you got, you get ready to deploy again. Now you have to disconnect with your family. And to me, the family is, is it is like the number one, but Right. As all this going and coming, uh, you know, going away and coming home is uh, connect, disconnect, connect, disconnect. And through it, I tended, I think I started to lose myself. And even when my deployments were done, there was still part of me that I, things I had done, uh, things that had happened or whatever downrange, there was part of me that I felt maybe not ashamed, uh, well, ashamed of, and it's not because I necessarily did something wrong, but it was just some bad stuff, you know? Um, and it came, you know, through the years, even now that I'm home, I was still at some way, um, disconnected. And I wouldn't say I was disconnected from my family, but I was disconnected from showing the people that I loved who I really was. Right. Um, because I had anger issues, uh, I would get this stuff pent up into me because now I'm not, there's no place for me to go to let it out anymore. Um, or to, so almost to the feeling of, was I really being who I truly am in front of the people that I love? Because I, I was afraid that if they saw me, um, what I really wanted to do to that person that just cut me off or that person (laughs) that just gave me that look if I were to show them what I really wanted to do to them, dude, they, they would not respect me anymore. And I right. had these feelings. And, and so there was like this point where I was afraid I was going to, you know, I would lose it in front of them. And I did lose it once in front of my children. Yeah. And I was ashamed. Uh, and it, I, you know, a guy on a motorcycle had cut me off and I was probably home for three days. Um, I just gotten back from a deployment. I was home for like two or three days yeah. and I had my kids in the car with me. Um, I was, I had to do a half a day at work, went and picked my kids up from school or from daycare or whatever. And then I was on my way to pick up my wife from work at the hospital, this motorcycle. I, and I might've done something. I might've cut him off earlier. I don't know. Right. But right. He just like starts <clears throat> coming up next to me and flipping me off and cutting me off and then slowing down. And now I'm like, my mind's spinning, man. Yeah, yeah. And he unfortunately gets off on the same exit I had to get off. Oh, man. And uh, he gets off his motorcycle. I get out of my car. Thank God the dude was wearing a helmet because, you know, there's some words, you know, he's told me to get back in my car before my kids are embarrassed in front of me. And that's fine. That's not what got me. Yeah, yeah. What got me was, is now I'm in a different mode. I'm in, a, I'm in sure. fight mode. And right. I saw him move. And I don't know if he was going to scratch his ass or to hit me, but it, no matter what it was, it wasn't going to happen. So I ended up taking his head and bouncing him off those concrete barriers, those little three foot barriers a couple of times. Uh, and next thing you know, I'm standing over this dude and I'm looking down at him and I'm like, I'm look up and I got my three kids in the car. I'm like, what did I just do? Yeah. I, my glasses had fallen off. So I pick up my glasses, put my glasses back on. I step over the da- guy and I walk back to the car and get in the car. And at this, at this point, this whole thing of pure embarrassment and regret is coming over me because I just showed my kids who I really am. Yeah. 
is that really who I am? No, but that's who I can be. Right. And, and that's not who I want to be. Uh, and so now I'm just, that guy gets up, gets on his motorcycle and, and people are just like st- sitting in their cars, just like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> um, the light turns green. I go. And uh, so now I'm, I'm looking at my kids and or I'm driving and I, I just tell my kids, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I po- I'm so sorry. I apologize. And the car's just like quiet. I think the, the twins had to be probably six or seven. Jamin was just a baby still. Just this whole thing of emotions flowed, you know, flowed through me. And I was like, man. So, and I'm still, I was still in uniform. Oh, really? So I'm representing the Air Force like this, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I get to the, I get to the hospital, pick up the wife. I give her the keys. I was like, you got to drive. I can't, I can't do this, you know? But that, that was for years, you know, parts of that was me. But now yeah. I, I would never show that to my kids or my family again. So I'm building it. I'm holding it in and it's building and it's building. And then you just, this pressure of like, why can't I be, why can't I really be able to show my emotions? Right. And there is a, a, a fear factor there. Um, so I get to you. Uh, I get an opportunity, a guy named Brad Emron, who was an SF medic who I'd known for years, he ended up going through the course and he talked me into going. And so I call him, you do an interview. And, and a lot of the, a lot of the guys that go to this course are at, on their last thread, you mm-hmm. know, um, suicide, you know, is, is a big part of it. I, I never felt like I was suicidal to the, you know, so I, and I really questioned whether this was for me or not because I wasn't suicidal. So, uh, I did the interview and the guy's like, that has nothing to do with it. Uh, he's like, are you just where you need to be in life? And I said, no. And so we went through the interview and he's like, you're a good candidate. And so I ended up going and finding out that, uh, you know, what, what I considered PTS is not what I thought PTS was, Yeah, you know, it has, it, it's rooted from a lot of things and there's, there's your combat trauma and your PTS and you put those things together and then that's where you come up with what we, the problems we have, you know? Oh, okay. So you had to, I had to deal with not only my combat trauma of the things that happened downrange, which I thought, I thought it really was. I thought that's what it all was about, Right. but right. it was also uh, my, my, my pre-adolescent, my growing up, the environment I grew up in and taking those two and putting them together, dude, it just opened up a whole new world, you know, and confronting it and not just uh, the thing with the save a warrior is they take you through the three stages. One is under seeing it, right. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to deal with it. You've got to meet it head on and you've got to freaking deal with it. Right. And then you come out on the end. The third part is being released of all that, you know, um, which is, dude, it was amazing. Yeah. I feel so uh, free now. And when I say free, I say, I mean, um, being open to be myself now, truly who I am. I have nothing to nothing to hide anymore, nothing to yeah. feel that I feel I have to hide, uh, totally comfortable with myself and my own skin now. And, and instead of this meanness and hate, it's, I see now it's, there's, it doesn't need to be that. And so yeah. I, I, I see this world now is kind of funny for me to say it for me is like peace and love. And I truly mean that, Yeah, you know, I really mean that. Like, why be mad at that person and not just give them love no matter who, All right. you know, and, yeah, yeah. and to be able to see that and to feel that man. And so it's like the forgiveness part and, you know, it's just being able to forgive and, and it's, do I still go to these places? Yeah. But now I can recognize when I'm going there and I'm starting to get mad or I'm starting to get these feelings and I can recognize it and be like, Oh, okay. Cause I'm never going to be truly 
you know, perfect, but I can recognize it. And then I can stop myself or I can talk to somebody. I can call up Billy or I can call up Rolo and be like, Hey dude, how was your day? And I'd be like, yeah, I don't know, man. It's a rough one. <laughs> yeah. And I'd be like, good, good. Did you, have you meditated? Have you, you know what I mean? Have you yeah, used yeah. all these tools available? Apparently you're using one because you're giving me a call, which is a great tool that you got right. people you can call. Uh, so that, that just puts, it put me in a different place in my life, man, to, uh, you know, I talked about my respect and, and love for my wife, dude, it's, it's no, it's even more now. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Sure. To yeah. be able to give her all of my love to be able yeah. to, there, there's a lot of, you know, uh, there was a lot of, uh, regret that I had about being away from my kids so much. Yeah. Um, and so, and that was part of it too. I had to come to that because it, I felt like I could have been a better dad. It could have been there more. My kids didn't get, you know, I wasn't there for all the football games, all the, um, baseball games, wrestling matches, um, Christmases, you know what I mean? Right. And, birth yeah. and so there's that regret and feel of like, man, I, I didn't do the best job. But then to be able to go through Save a Warrior and understand that it is what it is. And it's, and, and then to be able to come back to my kids and, and, and not really say that I'm sorry, but to say that I, uh, that I love them and, and to have them come back and for me to see it through different eyes for them to tell me that they love me and that they respect me and me see it in a different way. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, it's something. Yeah. And it, and it sucks that it takes people so long to get there. Right. You know? Uh, well, I think, I think it's guys like you and guys like Billy and, and Cam that can, you know, having the courage to say stuff like this will give everybody else kind of the, the, the permission or, you know, to go do the same thing and just, you know, I, I encourage everybody to go through this program. I've heard nothing but good things about it. I mean, it just seems like it's a life changing event, like just in not not in a hyperbolic kind of a way, but no kidding. Like you said, your outlook on life, your outlook on your kids, your wife, everything is completely different than you had before. And it's just amazing. Yeah, I, I get choked up when I talk about it because it's that powerful. Yeah. On how it's changed. And it and it and it's I think when I first got through it, it was very evident to me like how it had changed my life. But I now it's almost like did I go through the, this course? Because it's <laughs> almost like it I, I, I but I didn't I haven't fallen back into where I was. So now yeah. I think I'm I'm not there yet but I'm living more day to day that way I want to live, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so to me, that's like, wow, I'm not in that place anymore. I would recommend it to anybody. I, it was, you know, it's 70, it's, it's 72 hours. That's all it is. Yeah. But it's, it is, I got done with that 72 and you do nothing strenuous. And I was wrecked by that really? 72 hours wrecked. Um, emotionally, physically, and you sit in a chair freaking almost all day. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah. But I was physically and emotionally wrecked. I I don't think I cried, man. And that's, dude, I <laughs> cried so, you know, and it was just not only for myself, but these other, you go through with this team of guys, these other guys that have all these other, you know, it was not just military people. There were firefighters and police officers going through the same exact things I was feeling, you know, and yeah. to hear their stories and to, it just like, boom, the floodgates open. I, I don't know if I hugged so much in my entire life because there was just a total thing of really showing you what, what love is and being right. non-judgmental, not judging anything, not, not being judged and not judging the others around you for some of the things and you listen to some of the stuff that happened, you're just like, man, you know, people go to prison for this shit. And to hear you're, yeah, yeah. you're this guy's telling you it and you're not judging him and you're just giving him love. And that's, yeah. uh, that's crazy. So yes. And, and 
I don't know if there's a way we can put that information out there, but it's, it's a very simple thing. It's you need to go to the website. Um, uh, I think it's, it's uh, saveawarrior.org. I think it is. Okay. Um, and you can go, you can find the application on there and you apply for an interview. Uh, they'll call, I mean, heck they'll call you usually within 24 hours uh, to just set up the interview and then yeah, yeah. find a date for you. You do the interview and honestly, did they they'll get you in a class pretty quick. I mean, they, they actually, <laughs> when I did my interviews, like, okay, well, when you want to go, like, you know, and he had these, the state named out this date and I'm like, Oh, well, you know, I got a trip on that. You know, I've got work, you know, a work trip I'm going on. And then he's like, well, how about this date? And I was like, ah, that's like my son's birthday or something like that. And then he just like stopped. He's like, all right, when you're serious about this, you let me know. And it was like, I was like, Whoa, you know, yeah. he's like, as, he's like, I'm, this is, this is here to save your life. And right. until you're ser- want to get sick, I was like, well, give me one more date. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> I was like, give me one more date. Give me another so, chance. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, Just give me one more date. And he's like, how about this? And I was like, yes. And so he's like, all right. <laughs> but he's, he like, they, they weren't joking around. He's like, well, you just let me know when you're serious about this. And I'm like, what? I am serious. You know, he's like, when yeah. you're serious and when you're ready to change your life, it's a big decision. You and know? that's, and, that's and you, and he's like, you're yeah. the one that, that got a hold of us. We didn't get a hold of you. Right. So when you're really serious about this, you let me know. And so I, he did, he gave me, he was kind enough to give me one more date and I, and I took it and I thank God I, I did take it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Because he, he wanted to illustrate to you and now, you know, because you've been through it and I, I haven't even been through it. And I feel like I know because just from the way you and Billy and, and, and Cam talk about it, it's, it just seems so powerful, but he's like, this is, this is a priority in your life. Like all that other stuff work. And yes, your kids are definitely a priority, but there are things that are much more important, which is your mental health. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that should oh, be that's... just as important as anything else. And I think that's what he was trying to illustrate to you. Like, come on, man, this is a big deal. It's not, this is not a, not something to be taken lightly for sure. Yeah. And what was so cool about it is, so I heard about this from this guy, Brad, right? Yeah. And as I'm doing my interview, the guy's giving me my interview. He's like, Hey, do you know, uh, Billy Otter? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, well, Billy's been through this. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, Billy's actually a shepherd. And I'm like, what? Yeah. So then he's like, yeah, I'll get you his number if you want. And I was like, sure. So I call it Billy. And Billy's like, I'm going to be there. So when I got to that, when I got to the location, Billy was one of the shepherds from, and man. That probably made it easy and not easy, but like it probably made it a little more comfortable. The connect. Yes. The, the, yeah. him being there probably changed my experience. Nice. Um, because now when, when I was talking about some things, he, he knew what I, he related to what I was talking about. Yeah. Um, and then to have somebody, you know, when you feel feeling like at your lowest point to come up and to, to not just give you a hug, but to give you a, a hug. I mean, and Billy's a big boy. So when Billy yeah. gives you a hug, it's like he <laughs> engulfs you, man. And right, right. just to, to melt into that. And I, I, I got to tell this, let me give you this. Um, I hadn't said this guy's name, Marty Klukas was another one of the guys that was like jazz to me. I always wanted oh. to, but more in the yeah. fact that I always wanted to be like Marty Klukas. Cause that dude was my, that dude was the man. He's the, he's the, he's like a Kenny. When I think of, I think Marty, I think Kenny, I think jazz, like they're yes. all yes. like, they're yes. just, so just M- Marty was another big ultimate role models me in my life. I think as far as me wanting to be like him and then later in life, being able to talk with him a little bit more and getting to know him personally a little bit better. But I, I, that hug thing I was talking to you about Billy giving me at that time. Yeah. I felt that one other time, uh, in my career. And that was the night I got back from being in Afghanistan. The first time remember we said we came back to Uzbek. Um, we landed and for some reason, uh, I team went one way. I go into this other tent 
and I'm sitting there and I'm just, you know, we just came out of the box. Right. So now I'm just trying to decompress, like what the heck did just happened over these, you know, like, right. wow. Yeah. And I'm sitting there and I remember there was, uh, uh, Mari Povich or something was on or somebody was on like that, not Mari Povich. Who's the other guy? But anyway, Jerry was, Springer or something. Yeah. Jerry Springer was on in the corner in this little TV, a little TV in this tent. And I'm just sitting there and I just remember something. I don't even know what it's talking about, but I just remember that. I was just like trying to breathe. And, uh, I look up in this dark silhouette, right? Cause it's dim lighting and everything. And this yeah, yeah. big ass silhouette of a dude standing <laughs> in this, this tent entrance way. And I look up and it's, it's Marty. And, uh, I stand up and he walks up to me and he gives me that hug. The same one that I felt from Billy, uh, at that time. But that was, he just, and it, dude, I just start crying, you know, yeah. and he's whole, I don't even know if Marty even remembers this. I, I yeah. truly don't. Cause he probably did it to like everybody. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. To me, that was such a special moment and that feeling that I had at that point of feeling totally uh um vulnerable yeah you know like everything had been peeled off and him giving me a hug made me feel like totally vulnerable so I fast forward that to the save a warrior when Billy's giving me that hug I felt that total vulnerable but in a different way that I was free now yeah um, from Billy. So great, great, that save a warrior, man. I can't say enough about it. Yeah. Uh, I would recommend that to anybody. I, so. I encourage anybody watching this to can, would you mind if like, if somebody knows you, would you no. mind if they reached out to you and yes, my number, maybe have you or Billy be there for them if they want to go through it or, or something yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah. Good. Billy's a good one. Uh, Rolo, Rolo end up going through it. Um, I think you had Rolo on a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, he's, he, uh, I'm just, sure I just talked to I'm him. I'm sure and, he talked a, a little bit about it. And yeah, um, so that's Rolo what I'm saying. It's I, like just the three, the three you guys talking about it makes. I mean, it's just so powerful, so awesome. Yeah. And and Rolo and I work together, right? So we work in the right, same right. business together. So I get to talk to him almost every day. That's just oh, it's awesome. Hard. So him and I talk every day, yeah. and there might be you know five ten minutes of work, but then it's like. A half an hour of him and I. So for right. me to continue, you know, he is my, you know, he's a backstop for me. Sure. Uh, like, and I hope that like to think that he, I'm a backstop for him too, because we've both been through this program together and we're both growing. And just to see where he was to where he is now is just amazing. Cause he's an amazing yeah. man anyway. Oh yeah. Uh, for sure. A uh, very humble, quiet, uh, quiet. And he's already got this like super kind, loving heart, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just to see what save a warrior did for him and letting him be himself, man, it's just his growth in, in his personal life has been amazing for me to see, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Save a warrior. That's man. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All you got to do is pay your way there. The, the seat is free. The ticket is no transportation. You got to pay for your own transportation, but the seat to sit in that seat for 72 hours is free. Okay. So they pay for you the, you know, the food is provided the, you know, um, but you do got to pity. And you know, the TACP foundation, uh, I think would help if dudes have need help with probably airfare or, you know, gas money or whatever to get there. Cause it's in Ohio. I'm sure the TACP foundation would help. Cause I, you know, talking with Tommy on this stuff, I think, yeah. you know, Oh, they have the few advocates to. for you getting people help when they need it for sure. Yeah. Like any kind of mental health thing or any, anything at all They're they've been super, super helpful with that kind of stuff. You're right. Yeah. yeah. So if you, the good point to reach out to Tommy, reach out to the foundation, you know, if you're having, if you're struggling, uh, if you're across the country or something, you need help getting over there, just reach out to them yeah. and see if they can help you out for sure. Yeah. And dude, how about that? Our, our TACP foundation and oh it's amazing how has that come along dude it's just i can't talk enough about some of these people man that are right. in our community and the you know the things that we did are kind of cool 
but some of the things these guys are doing for our career field and uh man. life changing Tech, i mean life changing, life, life saving uh, frankly yeah i mean so to see guys, where yeah. our tac p foundation used to be or you know tac p association or whatever you know right. it just used to be a thing for dudes to get together and drink beer and do a golf tournament or something now we're yeah, like yeah. you know taking care of families you know these right. kids giving them opportunities uh for their kids and these families and the men themselves you know their mental health yeah. aspect of life dude wow it's amazing it really is it's 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 uh, inspiring for sure i mean mm -hmm. just to see these guys that get because it's it's all on their own time too. It's not like they're, you know, somebody's paying them to do it. They're, they're just taking their time, their own and their own effort. And yeah, it's amazing. It really is. It's really cool. Yeah. Well, all right, Sean, man, this has been phenomenal, yeah. dude. I mean, I can't thank you enough for doing this. this is so I feel great. like we just Number like one, catching up with you. Cause I haven't seen you in so long, but just <laughs> yeah. hearing, hearing your story and, and uh, you know, everything has been great, man. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on here. Soon. No, I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for what you're doing. I, I think this, this, this to me falls, falls in line with the TACP Association, TACP Foundation, just you oh, setting something it's like nice this to up say. to let, you know, to let people like, you know, to get on here and, and give their stories. Cause like you've had on, you've had on uh, Marty and jazz and, you know, Bill, you have like, you know, uh, Schleich and, you know, you've had yeah. all these guys on, all dudes that I respect immensely and to hear their story, to hear it get out there. It's like, I'm happy to hear it because those dudes have stories that are made that have made this career field right. so much better. Yeah. And, uh, for you to take the time to, uh, let these guys talk, man, thank you. Yeah. I'm so it's happy. my pleasure. It really is my pleasure. I love, I love doing it. I love it. And thank you for letting me be a part of this, man. I, I feel Oh, for sure. hundred percent. You, you more and... than qualify, but man, I'm telling you, yeah, you're, you, you're, you're right up there in my, on my book, man. I'm telling you, uh, you're a hard, you're a hard charger, heavy hitter and good friend of mine. So yeah, that, yeah. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I appreciate it. Well, it's nice seeing you again, man. And yeah, uh, for sure. I hope it, we don't go this long again without talking. Cause, uh, same. Yeah. It's nice sure. to see you, man. And I'm happy for you. Uh, and glad to see that your family's doing well. Uh, yeah, you just too. dude, that's where it hits my heart, man. So very, yeah. very, very happy for you. Yeah, I'm glad Thank you got you. to see my daughter uh, come in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love it, Do man. Do love interruption. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. All right, brother. All right, man. I'll All right, talk, talk to, you, talk to you later. All right, All right. bye.